Hey, Lisa. Your hair is longer. It looks good. <laughs> thank you. Lisa and Chris, how are you? Pat, your hey, hair is you. not longer. Right, and it's <laughs> never going to be again. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> All right, I think we are being recorded, so I'm ready to be call this meeting of GOL uh, to order on September 2nd. It is, according to my watch, exactly 1030. Um, and pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12 order of 2020, suspending certain provisions of open meeting law, this meeting of GOL is being conducted by remote participation and it is being recorded. And uh, if Paul, in the attendee room, do you want to admit him? Uh, no, actually, I'm trying to keep this. <laughs> uh, we can talk about this later if we want. Um, but uh, I've already taken some arbitrary decisions as chair that I've gotten some grief for, rightly so, I think. Um, so at this moment, uh, let's hold off on that because um, I want to say a few things before we start. Um, if we could put the agenda up, if that's possible, Mandy, I'd appreciate it. Um, it um, but I just want to go through that quickly with you all. Um, for Lynn's sake, especially since she may need to, to bow out at a certain point, but also for the sake of... Uh, those of you who are visiting today as panelists, so you understand what uh, we're going to be doing and make sure that it's also agreeable to my colleagues. And the first thing I need to do before I even do that is make sure everybody can be heard and I can hear them. And I think that's true, but normally that's what we do. And so I'm gonna start with Andy Steinberg. Yes, I'm here. All right, thank you. So if you are uh, muted, you could unmute when I ask you and then just mute again. Mandy Jo? Yes, I'm here. Great, Lauren Goldberg? I'm here. Great, Lauren, thank you. Lynn? Here. Lisa Clausen? Yep, here. Thank you, Lisa, great. Pat DeAngelis? Here. And Chris Suris? Present. Great, I think, is that everybody? Yeah, my screen's a little truncated, but I think that's everybody. So everyone can be heard and is present. Otherwise, I'd like you for the moment to mute yourselves. Um, since we have so many people on, background noise, uh, my telephone sometimes, <laughs> which I think I've just connected. Yes, I have. So hopefully that won't come in. Um, if you look at the agenda quickly, uh, we're going to begin with the uh, discussion of wage theft bylaw, and uh, then we're going to turn to goals. And I'm imagining this first part will take uh, no more than an hour. Um, hopefully not that much, but that's what I budgeted for it. In the second half of the meeting, we'll focus on goals to give Lynn some idea. We do have a couple of sets of minutes to look at. The August 19 minutes are not in your packet, and that is the fault of your chair, not the fault of the clerk or of the minutes taker. I had them in time, and I thought I put them in, but I did not. So we only have the uh, July 29 and August 5 minutes, but I do hope we can get to those today briefly and get them out the door. Um, August 19, we'll have to wait until next time. Um, briefly, uh, the way I want to handle this, and my committee members are welcome to weigh in, um, is I would like to begin with um, Lauren and questions uh, that this committee has for her of the, uh, based on the memo that um, KP Law sent to us um, and asking her to respond to those questions and have a back and forth with the committee. Um, when that is finished, uh, at whatever point that is finished, then I would turn to the committee members and ask them if they have any questions for our two guest panelists. Um, and at that point there, uh, you know, based on whatever questions they're asked, they are free to respond. But I would ask that we not have a back and forth between the attorneys. I would ask that there not be any statements made. Um, our focus today, um, since this is GOL, is really not on specifically the merits or demerits of this bylaw, but on its legal uh, repercussions. And um, we are, have invited Lauren here as our town attorney to advise us on that specific issue. Um, and that's the focus of this first hour. So once we're done with questions for Lauren and Lauren has answered them to the best of her ability, um, I will turn back to the committee and ask them if they have any questions for our um, visiting panelists. Um, I invited Chris Suris at a request by Lisa. I think I explained that to you in email. Um, I realized I may have exceeded my authority, but I felt that if I waited, <laughs> we would have had yet another two week delay um, and since your questions for Lisa, as my understanding was, your questions for her are on the issue of legal matters, it seemed appropriate and useful for her to invite Chris, who is 
I think, someone who's particularly versed in that. So um, any comments or concerns about what I've just laid out? Okay, I hear none. I see you can raise your hand or you can just physically raise your hand. Um, I'll respond to either. Um, and so Lauren, please, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just wondering um, about letting in attendees because this meeting is posted as a public meeting, right? Um, I just don't want to run into any issues. So um, I think uh, people that are attendees, I don't believe can speak without permission in any event, but um, at least get to listen. Right, so our custom has been in the past to bring attendees into the meeting during public comment or when the committee requests that they be brought in as part of the discussion. And um, so I've made two, I made Lisa and Chris panelists um, because I had been asked by the committee to invite them. Um, perhaps it would have been wiser for me to keep them as attendees and then invite them into the meeting at the appropriate point. Um, anyway, that's perhaps my mistake, but um, no. they, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Andy. Mr. No, I wasn't concerned about, um, about them being on the panel. That's completely fine. I just wanted right. to make sure that the attendees were actually allowed because I know that uh, the council president had mentioned that there are people in the waiting room. So I just didn't want to um, right. have us run there into are, There are no people in a waiting room at this point at all that I can tell. Right. Good. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Sorry. But an attendee is Paul Bachelman. Right. And, and Margaret. Who's, who's he? I'm sorry. Paul who? <laughs> all right. That's my Paul end of the humor for today. Um, any other questions, comments? Paul is familiar about bringing the town manager into the room. I, I will certainly do so if we wish. Is that what people would like? He has said that he would just as soon listen and not be brought in. He's only all right. That's OK. Thanks. And also, we see Kathy Shane is here as a panelist. Uh, good morning, Kathy. Um, she also was invited to this meeting. And so she is, um, uh, well, she's welcome to come anytime, but she's uh, a panelist. She's also one of the sponsors that went oh, along. Thank, thank you. Mandy. Exactly. Thank you, Pat. Right. All right. Um, I don't see the need to put the memo up on the screen, uh, though we could if we want to. Um, uh, that's really up to the committee members. Um, you've all had a chance to read it. Um, I think one of the questions that certainly I have, but I'm going to, well, we'll wait for my questions. Um, let's turn to my colleagues. And um, again, the purpose here is to um, address to Lauren your questions or concerns about that memo. Again, you can just raise your hand or use the raise hand function. Um, hopefully I can see both. I can see both. I think, I think I'd like to hear Lauren's uh, reasoning behind, uh, um, I don't have the memo in front of me. Well, we can put it on the screen. Uh, briefly, yeah, that'd be good. I'm, I apologize, I thought I had printed it out. I'm concerned about your reaction uh, or the, the statement that bylaws should be aspirational. That doesn't make sense to me since we're a legislative body and we're creating bylaws that people are going to be following in our town. I'm, I'd like some clarification on the problems that you see with um, the section uh, C2H um, about uh, the number of African Americans, um, the divert women, veterans, etc. Because we're saying that if a contractor does, um, tries to get that complement of people or those percentages and can't, that they're not punished or um, kept from bidding. Also, many contractors already have their crews established. And, and if that's the case, they're not going to be looking to f uh, fill positions. So I just want some clarification there. And also about aspirational bylaws. Mr. Chair, if I may. Please go right ahead, Lauren. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so I guess I should start this off by saying, um, and I, I, if we can just back up a tiny bit, I think it would be useful. Um, obviously, the town's legislative body has the ability to promulgate um, bylaws, essentially ordinances, um, without uh, any uh, review by the attorney general. And one of the things that we find that happens with respect to 
um, the cities uh, is that there are bylaws adopted that probably can't be enforced, even though they're a really good idea. Um, and so to that end, um, when you look at a composition, when you're mandating composition of committees or you're um, you know, establishing uh, committee uh, requirements, it is often the case that we would refer to that as aspirational rather than um, mandatory. So essentially it's a guide for the legislative body or the appointing authority with respect to who um, you know, should be included. Um, and, and so that's, that was kind of the, that's the aspirational versus mandatory um, issue that I was discussing. With respect to these bylaws, um, there are obviously responsible contractor and uh, tip, tip uh, wage theft bylaws um, in many cities. And what we've discovered when we look at them is they're all, they're, there are some similarities and there are some differences. Um, but I think the biggest issue is the idea of trying to regulate something that is significantly regulated by state law. And so when those two things um, coincide uh, or, or in conflict, um, you know, what, what is the result there? So, um, you know, I, I've had the opportunity to take a look at a number of um, bylaws. And I, I would say, um, so, you know, under state law generally, uh, municipalities, and this is just for an example, can um, assess uh, fines under the non-criminal disposition process up to $300 a day. Um, and if you want to um, assess a fine under non-criminal disposition, you have to say what that amount um, is. So first violation, second violation, third violation. And I think you guys um, you know, are familiar with that process. Um, in addition, a court can enforce something um, and they can enforce it. And they also have the right to do um, up to $300 a day for violations of municipal bylaws and ordinances. Um, the difference is that the higher numbers that are referenced, for example, the, the um, $1,000 or um, $500, th those are typically amounts that are found in a statutory scheme that um, allows for enforcement by different entities. So for example, in our view, there is a little bit of kind of confusion about what the state, what role the state would have in these things and what role the town would have in these things. Um, you know, just as an example, in Boston, um, their living wage law uh, ordinance applies to only those projects that aren't subject to the prevailing wage law. Um, and, and the idea there is that prevailing wage law is covering a significant amount of information. Bottom line, from my perspective, is um, this is an important issue. Obviously, we know there are more and more communities looking at this um, and adopting bylaws in this um, context. I think um, there's uh, some towns are, are um, heading that way as well, and the AG will have an opportunity to look at those. Um, but I think the idea of how would we implement, how would we enforce, what kind of resources we're going to assign, and then that bigger question about the way these two things interact, the state law and the local law. Um, so again, I, I mean, obviously, the draft that you prepared is well done and thoughtful. Um, I would expect nothing less, less from, uh, from Amherst. And, um, you know, it's not our job uh, to say you can't do that. We wouldn't say that. I do think there are just things to be aware of where there um, may be difficulty enforcing um, and, and where, you know, the, the difference between state and local law uh, may create an issue. Good, thank you. Um, did you have a follow up, Pat? I, I'm just uh, looking at the uh, letter from Krakow, Soros and Landry, and they're talking about that, yes, we need to follow state law, but we also, a municipality uh, can make things stronger or slightly different as long as it doesn't contradict state laws. And can you comment on that? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's a great point. And yes, that is true. As, as everybody knows, like, for example, under the Wetlands Protection Act, there are certain minimum standards, but a municipality may make those standards more significant. Um, so they can create a larger buffer zone or an additional um, local enforcement. And, and again, I think the same issue ap applies here. My concern isn't that um, it's automatically inconsistent with state law. 
it's that there may be instances where making a more stringent or more restrictive local law may undermine or be in conflict with the state law requirements. So for example, prevailing wage is what prevailing wage is. It applies the way that it applies under state law. And so if we are adding to that or changing the standards, um, you know, that could that could raise an issue. Again, my my analysis of these issues is not intended to preclude or or to uh, suggest that you know we're saying uh, you can't do this. Of, of course, you have the ability as a legislative body to come up with a scheme that that you believe is appropriate. The question really comes from my perspective in enforcement and administration and how we make sure that there aren't conflicts with state law in doing so. Mandy, please. Sorry, as host, I can't actually use the raise hand button, so I'm gonna have to just. Wait. Either is fine. Either is fine. So I, I, I guess I have one topic, one question of clarification, um, and one sort of new question that relates. The question of clarification is: we we have two bylaws, and most of what you addressed in the email, and most recently was related to the um, TIF and contracting bylaw. Um, but you just said one thing that would relate to the wage and tip theft, which is the criminal enforcement block includes $1,000 right now. Um, so I guess my clarification is, is that legal to have it at 1000 or do we, in order to have this sort of generally be legal, must we reduce that as a GOL because we're looking at actionability here to $300. Um, and we have per aggrieved party, could we do that per aggrieved party per day? Um, and so that would increase sort of the thing because you mentioned a per day. So those are my questions related to that. It sounds like in your email you had no other concerns with that particular bylaw, the wage and tip theft. And so I'd want to confirm that. Um, and as to the contracting bylaw, what um, I know you're going to say it depends because that's the favorite answer of attorneys. Um, but I am curious what your thoughts are on the potential for if someone would sue us, the town, for after enactment of this, what the defenses would be and the potential for prevailing on those defenses. Mr. Chair, if I may. Please. Thank you. Um, okay, so the wage and tip theft bylaw, I, I do think generally that there are some issues with it that are similar to this question of what can you enforce locally versus, or what can you um, create locally versus what can you do under state law? And if there's a conflict between those, state law would govern. So, I mean, that's that's kind of where that comes down. Um, I know that there has been legislation pending statewide every single year, I think since 2015, it might be since 2014, on wage and theft, um, wage and theft or wage and tip. Um, theft. And so I, I do think there are issues if they didn't need to do a state law, I think um, there would be more examples of local bylaws that are doing that. Um, again, as I said, I've noticed there are several in cities. Um, and, and again, my comment was that the attorney general wouldn't have reviewed those. And, and, and that's okay. I mean, you know, it's okay to push the, uh, to push the boundaries and it's okay to establish priorities and under the home rule amendment to the Massachusetts Constitution, every city and town is given the ability to adopt bylaws and ordinances that are not in conflict with state law. So if we were to be challenged, um, you know, after passage of this, then that's what we would be arguing. We'd be arguing that we have the ability on the local level to do anything that's not inconsistent with state law. And we would lay out the reasons why we believe it is not um, again, I think it would be more on a case by case basis that we might see a challenge. So, for example, if someone's a losing bidder, um, that they would, you know, be able to raise that and say, well, that unfairly affected my, um, my uh, proposal. Now, <clears throat> as was pointed out, and also said in the bylaw that those, um, that, that the inability to get different um, members, uh, I'm sorry, to, to hire different folks wouldn't be negatively held against someone or wouldn't be held against someone. But the, the fact that it's there suggests that it's a priority, which could then affect the way 
that um, the town's uh, you know, um, procurement uh, process would unfold. I know, I mean, and, and I, I don't wanna to overstate, um, there are many towns that have bylaws like this, um, the responsible contractor bylaws. And um, it, is, it is the case that um, they have been approved by the attorney general. So uh, again, I think the, the real issue is to try and review what you have drafted and see where the potential, the, the more significant potential risks are um, and tweak for that. Um, and, you know, again, knowing this is an important issue in the town. Um, and so, you know, as, as I said earlier, I think um, there's always value in um, kind of looking at these things from the side of what leaves us subject to challenge. And Mandy Joe, I know, um, you know, you said that the lawyer in me was going to want to respond. It depends. And that's true. Um, the reason being is that as the town's lawyer, my job is to essentially point out all the risks and then facilitate you getting done what you want to get done. So, um, you know, I didn't go through word by word by word and provide you with a revised draft. I'm certainly happy to do so at a future point, and especially after I, you know, uh, especially after I hear your feedback, it would be helpful for me to understand exactly why you made the choices that you did. Um, but on the other hand, you know, and, and again, um, I don't think it's illegal to have a uh, wage and tip theft bylaw, and I don't think it's illegal to have a responsible contractor bylaw. So bottom line is, it's a policy decision about what to include in those bylaws. Um, and again, the conservative side of me says, let's think about how we would implement this, what kind of local infrastructure we need, and how would we fund it, and how would it operate um, and what would the, the actual practical challenges on the ground be rather than just the words in the document? I see Kathy's hand. I see. I'm going to go to Lynn first, then Kathy. Lynn? Uh, why don't you go to Kathy as a co sponsor and then come back to me? All right, Lynn passes. Kathy, you're on. Thank you, Lynn. Um, thank you, Lauren. Um, I, I have a follow-up question to the same issues that uh, we initially focused it on, the $1,000 and the $500. Does state law currently have a penalty for retaliation? Because the $1,000 is attached to retaliation. So that's just a pure question, and it shows that I do not know what the state law does now. So we went high on that to be really just don't do this, you know, discouraging people from even filing or making threats. And then our process violation, the other one that's at 500, it's Mandy's question. If we were at the $300 level, um, will that preserve be more protective of us. Um, so then my last comment is we already have an employer, responsible employer on the books. Um, the main change that we've done is we've expanded, um, it's what Pat flag, we've expanded um, a make a good faith effort on women and minorities. Um, and we know that uh, the state is doing that in their contracting as is as in mass. So we looked and said, there are other places that are doing this. So even on undue burden to a contractor, if they're a big contractor, they're used to bidding with having to provide this kind of information. So um, I didn't know whether you thought that was problematic or not, but we purposely did it knowing that it was already in other bylaws. Um, and I guess that was one main change we made with the responsible employer. And then we brought in TIF that we can, um, if, if, and we only have one time, we've done this in Amherst, but if we've given tax relief, we put your tax relief money at risk if you violate, you know, so that's just a separate. So, so otherwise the responsible employer piece was expanded rather than brand new to Amherst. So, so I just wanted to get your 
thinking on the retaliation issue and the process issue on 500 versus 300. Thank you. Um, so let me first say that under state law, unless there is another particular section or, or particular fine that's allowed it to be uh, enforced locally or criminally, then the actual limit is $300 per violation per day. Um, and that's the highest amount a court can go unless something in a statute says otherwise. So for example, let's just take the wage and theft um, bylaw for a second, um, the wage theft bylaw. Um, if there is a criminal, um, a criminal action brought, then a judge would have the ability to issue a violation up to the amount allowed by statute. But a town, in my experience, doesn't get to just adopt that into their own bylaws or ordinances. It's the state statute, that's the enforcement mechanism available, and that's how they can enforce. So when we're talking about um, inconsistencies with state law, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. If the law said local official, I mean, local, this can be addressed by local bylaw and enforced in the same way, well, now we have, you know, a higher, um, a higher uh, non um, criminal or non criminal um, number to pursue, uh, penalty to pursue. But other than that, you're stuck with this $300 a day. And there's very few exceptions, although there are some in there for, um, you know, the types of things that you might imagine, like um, hazardous waste and that kind of stuff, um, which Mandy Joe is a very legal term, you know, stuff. Um, so I guess my, you know, I, I come back to <clears throat> if something's a violation of state law, it's a violation of state law and the town doesn't need to, to or, or, or the town doesn't have the authority to prosecute those, those violations under state law. Attorney General, the, the, the Division of Fair Labor Standards, um, they have authority under state law to, um, to enforce wage and theft issues and um, uh, uh, prevailing wage. The town bylaw, a violation of a town bylaw, um, you know, there, there are things that, that the town can do that aren't essentially adopting the state law into the town bylaws and saying a violation of this is also a violation. So um, do I think you can have, for example, a, um, you know, the, the licensing board, um, you know, investigate and investigate violations? Of course I do. Absolutely. Um, do, do I think that you could have a, um, you know, a coordinator who basically keeps track of wage and theft violation counts or claims. Um, could you require that they be filing those with, with the town when it's filed with the state? I think you could, um, but the state law is enforced by the state and the town's bylaw would be a different type of enforcement mechanism. So just to, to try to make my first question, does the state law already have a penalty for retaliation? Yes, there um, adverse action, civil penalty of up to $15,000 per, per violation, payment of one um, and two months wage, payment of between one and two months wages, and a fine of not more than 25,000 or imprisonment for not more than one year for a first offense. So the state has laws that address that and have criminal penalties um, for violating the law. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lynn. Thanks. So I'm somebody who likes to have some real examples. And so to the extent, um, and I, I didn't mean to spring this on you, but you know, let give me a real example and what could go wrong? Of course, uh, workers right outside the window. I'm just gonna mute you for one second. And try Excuse me, I apologize. Um, so, I, I mean, I think this, let's think about it in the prevailing wage context, the prevailing wage law says that, um, you know, any uh, um, construction uh, public works contract 
has to uh, comply with prevailing wage. Um, and so the town layers on requirements that are different or in addition to, um, and that is found to be a violation um, by the licensing board or, or whatever. And they try to enforce um, under the bylaw and the person says, I've already complied with prevailing wage. So uh, how can I have violated, you know, anything locally? Um, I complied with state law in this regard. Um, and again, I think that's why Boston's prevailing, well, it's like healthy living wage law exempts anything um, that would already be subject to prevailing wage, because that's a statutory scheme that's out there. So the contractor comes back, they say, I've abided by state law, but they didn't abide by local. What is our recourse? I, I think the question becomes, um, when that uh, does the town have the ability to require uh, act action that's more than what's required under the prevailing wage law with respect to wages? And does that then disadvantage um, the contractor because they're complying with state law um, and you know their their um, compliance is uh, jeopardized or their their contract is jeopardized by not meeting local local requirements that are so, so under that scenario we could start down the road with a contractor they could have a um, suit brought against them for violation of the local law and would this cause them to stop work? Well, I think that's the question, right? How do we enforce a violation of the local law? Um, and again, th these aren't, these aren't um, issues that arise just in this context. And um, the, the question of whether the quote unquote field has been occupied by state law is um, one that is uh, debated roundly uh, by the Attorney General almost every time they look at bylaws. Um, and it is um, one of the subject matters that um, winds up being litigated. So for example, that Conservation Commission example I gave you earlier um, was actually decided um, by a court. So, uh, um, you know, again, I think it's trying to think through some of the ways that the practical side of this plays out and to um, you know, essentially gird against uh, there being repercussions that would at least give a, um, a dissatisfied contractor some leverage. So are we more at risk if over the issue of the amounts or over the issue of the condition that was violated? Um, that is a good question. To the extent that the amounts are not authorized by state law, the town could not enforce against a company that chose not to comply. Because if it says there's going to be a $5,000 violation, but there's no law that says it can be $5,000, the town can't enforce that. So the condition is much more likely to be the, the place where the town has the ability to um, craft a, a bylaw that is not inconsistent with state law, um, rather than than the amount that that five thousand dollar amount. And unless anybody knows of, of a provision of law that says that um, a violation of a town bylaw, even one on this subject, can be enforced through criminal complaint to five thousand dollars, I just I don't think the law is there to support that. Um, but you know I. Uh, I think we're all learning as we go, especially with the um, wage and theft bylaw, wage theft bylaw that, um, or wage theft laws that um, are, as I said earlier, they're becoming more and more uh, common um, in cities, especially, and I do know of at least one town. And then in addition to that, um, there is some legislation pending with a report out date of October 20th. Um, and I'm happy to forward that to you guys if you don't already have it. If we, if you were going to review and revise anything in this bylaw, would it be more around the fees or would it be anything related to the conditions for violation? 
Um, so the, the amounts I would definitely address um, because, you know, as I said, I, I think there's an issue there. Um, and unless, I mean, again, I think, you know, my job is not to stand in the way of you doing something that you want to do, but it's to have you be able to do it in a way that doesn't expose you to risk. Um, and at that point, or the amount of risk that you might be willing to take on is completely up to you. And I, I don't want my comments to be interpreted in a different way. Um, ultimately, uh, I think the question of how this law would be enforced is something that um, we could take a closer look at and see, and then again, I'm talking about the tip and wage stuff, um, and see where, because even if you just look at it quickly, it lists all the state laws that are at issue. And so um, kind of bringing that state law right into the bylaw and then providing for a different resolution, I think we could craft something that's a little bit separate um, from the state law, um, but that, um, you know, so that there's not a, uh, you know, a law being enforced at the state level and also possibly at the local level. Thank you. Uh, Pat, I see your hand. Actually, I'm sorry, Andy has his hand up and then I'll go to Pat. Andy? Hi, uh, good morning, uh, Lauren. So I, I was thinking of um, three different things. Uh, and I have to say that uh, the one of the things that causes me to at least um, pause for a moment, and even though I really am a supporter of what we're trying to accomplish here, um, is the cost of enforcement. And um, how, what kinds of experiences other cities have had that have these kinds of bylaws regarding the amount of staff time and um, frankly city attorney time that gets involved in the enforcement process. I uh, think that uh, council at least ought to be aware of what the expense might be. And I don't know if you have any comments on that. So that's Topic one, I don't know if you want me to handle them separately. I had three things, so I'll pause. I'm, I'm happy to respond to that. Um, in the city of Boston, and again, just as an example, in addition to their wage and theft, I mean, their, their healthy living um, or healthy wage um, bylaw, they have about 15 pages of regulations about how to implement it. It seems to me like there's a lot of um, resources that are directed at that. Um, Again, you know, the, the level to which the town chooses to enforce, as you know, the town has a lot of bylaws and we don't go around um, enforcing each of them every day. There's a, a certain amount, and this is kind of back pat to what I was saying about aspirational, there's a certain amount of um, purpose with the laws that just to say, this is what we're looking for and we expect you to meet that. Um, we don't have the resources to go and enforce everyone. And in fact, if you look at, you know, where cities and towns um, incur a lot of legal expenses, it is with respect to enforce, uh, enforcement actions, um, land use enforcement actions, um, bylaw enforcement actions, because, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're not um, cut and dry. It's one person's opinion compared to another person's opinion. So the more, um, you know, the more uh, that there is left to discretion, the more, the, the easier it is to challenge. Again, I, I don't think that means you can't have a bylaw, and I don't think it means that you can't have one that wouldn't lead to um, a significant amount of, of liability. I think it's worth thinking about at this stage, or potential liability. Um, what is the town's willingness to invest in, um, in this process? And, you know, I, I've read all the articles. I know that there's a significant interest in moving forward with this, and I, and I think that's great. Um, you know, again, it's more of a, what's the 360 view from a practical side, and how do we best limit potential liability? Um, and I'm sure, you know, I, I don't wanna, um, I don't want to uh, um, undermine the, or I, 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 I guess I should point out that it is always possible to make good arguments um, for and against something, and lawyers often do that. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's there's kind of some things that are very 
um, that are kind of just plain, plain truths. And so the plain truth is if having a six foot fence is a violate or six foot, if there's a six foot fence limitation and someone puts a six foot eight fence up, well, we can look at that and we can say it's a violation. And if we had to go to court and we said, we told this person to take down their fence, they didn't have any other, you know, grandfathering, or, or I know that's not a term we, we're using right now. They didn't have any prior, um, uh, prior allowable use. And so that fence needs to come down. Well, that's easy because it's obviously a violation. It's a six foot eight fence instead of a six foot fence. Um, it becomes harder when we're being asked to kind of involve ourselves in the um, kind of internal operations of private businesses or businesses that yes, are, are contracting with the town. And so, um, you know, we do have the ability to limit some or to impose some conditions, but ultimately that, you know, to the extent that something requires, um, you know, a weighing of one person's word against another and one person's documents against another, you start down a road that is potentially litigious because whoever doesn't win is going to have, um, you know, a, a, in theory would have a reason to challenge. Um, and I think that's for any new bylaw. And I don't want to suggest that it's just a wage and tip bylaw or just the responsible contractor bylaw. Um, these are the kinds of things that we deal with on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, bottom line is if this is what's important to you and you choose to do it, um, then, you know, the council will, I'm not, not the town council, but town attorney um, will defend your actions to the best ability of their, um, based on the facts and the law. And there will always be good arguments to make about why um, it is consistent with law and why they're, um, why it is clear cut and not a gray area. Um, but again, I think at this point, you're kind of looking towards the future and saying, is this, is this something we're willing to invest in? Is this something that we think the town can enforce? And what kind of resources do we have to, to put to that um, and to kind of dedicate to um, enforcing this, this bylaw? Thank you. Um, we go on to the second of my three questions, and that has to do with um, the definition that we've given to tax relief. And it's really something I um, pose for the sponsors to. to um, tax relief, as it's defined in the bylaws, um, uh, then talks about the TIF program. We actually have a very important additional tax relief program that we established, which is kind of unique to Amherst, having to do with uh, the uh, affordable housing and allowing the town to grant tax incentives for um, affordable housing units. And in fact, that was granted by the select board for North Square and North Square has actually been one of the um, projects that has been cited as a reason why we should be pursuing this. Um, and so I was uh, wondering um, whether the definition of tax relief could be written in a way that doesn't just um, deal with TIF, but also deals with the additional um, provision that I just referred to. Um, so, Andy, I have to look at the, the definition, um, because I didn't look at it with this question in mind, so I'll certainly do that. Um, again, I think you're going to find that the area of taxation is one that is highly regulated by the state. Um, there are certain abilities to, um, to, thank you. <laughs> Andy Joe, very helpful. Um, there are certain, um, abilities, uh, to provide uh, relief, and those are essentially all outlined by state law. So tax relief, um, you're talking about, you know, what, what kind of relief can be granted by a town under a, a tax incentive financing agreement? Well, that is regulated by state law or pursuant to any other provision of law or regulation authorizing the town to grant tax relief. If there is a law that authorizes the town to 
um, to seek to provide tax relief, then that is absolutely fine. Um, regulation, it doesn't say whether it's state or local. Um, again, I would say if there's a regulation that relates to a provision of law providing tax relief, then the town can go ahead and do that. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know that this, this um, definition is problematic in any way. It's just important to remember that the, ta the process of local taxation is, um, you know, highly regulated by the state. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I um, don't think we're gonna solve it now, but I think it would be uh, important to be clear because it says um, also, um, or to any other provision of law or regulation authorizing the town to grant tax relief. And I believe we had special legislative authority that was granted to allow us to um, enact the bylaw that I was referring to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and Andy, that's exactly what I'm talking about, that you have to find that authority in a law, um, whether it's a general law or a special law, typically in order to grant tax relief, there has to be a law that authorizes it. Okay, I'm gonna leave that. And the other thing, Mandy, while I have it up here, um, I was gonna refer to section uh, C2H. Um, so you're pretty close to where it was. And um, it, it, it's the section that has, um, if you go a little bit farther, into, uh, gives percentages. Obviously, this has been highly litigated on a federal level of late, um, not to my happiness at all. But uh, the Supreme Court is going in the direction that it goes. Um, are we taking on any undue risks with that uh, particular subsection? Um, well, I mean, my immediate response to that was, you know, when you head down a road where you're requiring a potential uh, proposer to, um, you know, to em employ minimum numbers of hours to people of color, to women um, or to veterans, to any minority, you, there is a question about whether that is consistent with the standards for um, processing uh, procurement, uh, for procurement processes um, that are addressed by state law. Um, I mean, I think, you know, and, and I think it was Lynn who said earlier that, um, you know, there, or maybe it was Pat that said, in the event the contractor cannot find qualified workers, um, they shall submit documentation to the town. So it is not a, um, it, it's, they're able to explain why they haven't been able to meet those standards. But again, so what happens, who is making the decision about whether those efforts to meet the requirements were sufficient or not sufficient? Is there a decision to be made there and how does that impact um, the contractor's overall proposal? Thank you. Um, George, those are my three questions. So. Okay, thank you, Andy. Um, Pat, your hand is raised. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention um, to Lauren that we've already discussed implementation with the staff uh, and made changes that they found acceptable uh, with the town staff. And we, uh, part of that discussion involved the procurement officer who saw no difficulty with these issues. So I'm just gonna say that the other thing is, um, I guess if, I don't wanna make a back and forth between lawyers, but at the same time, I'd like to hear from Lisa Clausen and also uh, Christopher Soros about their um, experiences with these issues or uh, reflections on the th kinds of issues. Because I know Christopher was nodding his head in agreement with Lauren at, some, at one point. I don't have in my notes exactly where. So I'm just curious about what your reflections are and whether you can share them. Pat, if I, if I could just before we go, um, I, I obviously have the highest respect for the opinions of other attorneys. For me, this isn't about being right or wrong, it's about providing advice that um, is appropriately kind of conservative, but again, recognizing that this is a very important issue for the town. 
and it's not my job to stand in the way. Um, and I wouldn't do that. So I'm as interested as you in their responses. And, you know, I think the kind of collaborative um, way of dealing with this is, is great. Um, and to that extent as well, I'm glad that staff was involved. I think that's fantastic. I hadn't been aware of that. So I think that's really good. Um, so, you know, again, I think anytime you kind of go down a road where something's regulated by state law, it's useful to um, track down or, or identify what the problems could be, and then make sure that your document um, essentially hedges against those to the extent possible. So um, thank you for including me on this conversation. I appreciate that very much, Lauren. Yeah. Uh, Manny. Yeah, I know we're getting close to the time you wanted to do. So I, I think I just have one question and I'm hoping Lauren can answer this. Um, you initially reviewed both of these bylaws and it sounds like from the conversation that I've heard today that the only item that you found in direct conflict with a state law was the fine levels, um, the thousand dollars for criminal. I think our latest draft actually says 300 for non-criminal. Um, but that was the only item you found in direct conflict um, that would need changed in order to do this and everything else was more of a, um, it may or may not depending on what and then an enforcement issue. Is is that a correct, um, did I hear that correctly and interpret all your things correctly? <laughs> so um, thank you, Mandy Jo. I, um, in my view, the drafts could take a, another kind of like a Senate bills in third reading review. Um, and I, I know you made some amendments or some recommendations and I, I've seen that they've been worked on. Um, you know, I, I um, typically, even if I have concerns um, about a bylaw or not concerns, but if I see issues that I wanna raise, I know that ultimately the attorney general is gonna say, yes, you can or no, you can't in a town. And so, um, there are there are certainly times when I might raise issues like this um, and say, you know, but let's wait and see what happens um, with the attorney general. And I think here um, it's worthwhile. And I mean, obviously, you've invested this much time in it. Um, that's, you know, part of what you're doing. Uh, it's worthwhile to just kind of take that, as I said, that 360 look and um, also um, think about, uh, you know, unintended consequences or enforcement issues. Um, so in theory, um, I did not do a red line. Uh, no, I mean, in reality, I did not do a red line um, because I didn't see that as what I had been asked to do. Um, and I'm happy to kind of make some um, suggestions for you all to think about um, if that's what you want. Um, but, and again, I, you know, I recall Pat nodding her head like, no, no, we don't need that. Um, and that's fine. Um, I, think it's, I think it's important for you to just understand what the issues are um, and to make that policy decision about what you want to do about it. Um, and again, uh, there is there is still a final say on how something's dealt with and that that's a court. And, um, you know, so it, it's not like we're uh, never going to know if it's a problem. If people choose to um, to kind of um, challenge it, we'll we'll know right away. And then you know, we have an opportunity to either continue down the road enforcing the way that we have or to amend the bylaw. Um, you know, th these are not the kinds of things, it's not a charter which is set in stone essentially unless there's, um, you know, a, a local vote of the legislative body and a ballot question. This is a bylaw and bylaws can and are um, tweaked uh, as, as they are implemented to address, you know, practical issues. So again, you know, I don't see this as kind of the the end of, of a discussion. If it turns out that there are issues in terms of implementation, well, we'll know and we can change them. Um, if there are not, then you'll all remember back to this day and say, my God, she was worried about nothing. This was not an issue at all. And that's, that's okay. Um, again, my job is not to stand in the way and I wouldn't do that. My job is to help you do what it is you wanna do. And that is, you know, what I would plan on doing in whatever manner that was requested. So, you know, I'm, I'm here as a resource. Obviously you have other resources and that's great. Um, and, um, you know, that input from interested parties always 
result in a better outcome because we're, you know, we're all kind of thinking about what the issues are. So, um, you know, I, I, I feel badly that the way that, uh, that this kind of started is with, with um, this concept that I'm, I don't agree with any of the other terms. I, that's not it at all. My, um, you know, again, I, I saw my responsibility here as raising issues and um, just bringing them to your attention. Okay, I'm going to interject here um, for two quick points. Uh, actually, three. The first is time, but I think it's important that we uh, we have set a set of time, and we need to uh, for questions to um, to Lisa and to Chris. Um, but I think as a committee, we also face a question that I, I'm not asking us to resolve at this moment. I think I want to go to um, questions for our uh, two guests. And Lauren, you're welcome to stay. I hope you will stay, but that's totally up to you. Um, but I guess I just feel I have to say this. I, I, I thought that when we sent this to KP Law, we were going to get a uh, basically a red line uh, response. And uh, maybe I'm learning and we're learning as a committee to be more specific, but I think I can speak, I'll speak for myself. Um, I was more than taken aback by what we got. Um, so, which wasn't what I expected. Um, so maybe at some point through Paul, uh, I and perhaps the committee needs to have a conversation about what happens when we send something to you, especially a, a new bylaw. Um, mm -hmm. I certainly expected uh, something other than what we got. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question, well, let me just finish. Yeah, yes, of course. Um, thank you. Um, the question for this committee is whether we, um, and this is just for us to put in the back of our minds, I'm sure it's in the forefront of everyone's mind right now, whether we do in fact, as a matter of due diligence, as a matter of the fact that this committee is concerned with actionability and, is, and did expect something other than what it got, whether we need just to do our job to send this back to Lauren and ask her to do what I thought originally we had asked. That's something we need to think about and decide on today, not right this moment, but we need to be clear as a committee and then make that clear to Lauren what we're going to do next. Um, Lauren, I'm gonna give you a moment to respond to my comment, but what I'd like to do next then is turn to the committee and if they have specific questions or maybe they just wanna ask for um, a response, I don't know, you do decide. I, my idea was specific questions to Lisa and to Chris, but I do wanna make time for that. I also would like to point out to everyone that we are almost at the hour point. I'm not going to stop this, obviously, but we do have a very important issue to deal with in terms of goals. So I hope everyone will be brief, as brief as they possibly can be, um, because at some point I may just have to put a stop to this uh, so we can get to some other matters that we do have to get to. Um, so again, Lauren, if you want to respond to my uh, comment earlier, please go ahead. And then I'd like to go to questions to Chris and to Lisa. Certainly, thank you. And I apologize for any misunderstanding in what was provided. Um, my uh, approach here was this seemed like it had been uh, that we were down a road and um, I wasn't certain whether what you wanted back was essentially that that red line review or just my impression. So I apologize uh, for any misunderstanding. Um, typically, I will do a red line um, that there are uh, issues that might affect how much redlining I will do. And I have to say that this conversation, um, you know, helps me to understand better where you're coming from. And so, uh, you know, I think I'd be in a better position now to look through it with helpful um, feedback than, than I would have before. Um, but again, you know, my goal is to make your job easier, not to make it harder. And uh, to the extent that I did not do that, I am, of course, apologetic. So thank you for, for letting me speak to that. So I'm open to questions specific, or maybe the committee would simply prefer to allow Chris and or Lisa to um, present. Mandy, you have your hand raised, so please go ahead. I guess my question specific would be whether Chris and Lisa can directly address for this committee um, in their experience, because I know they've worked with other cities and towns to get these types of bylaws enacted. Um, once they've been enacted, do they have any experience with any cities or towns that have been sued? Um, for by a contractor or whatever under this bylaw, um, either for enforcement or non-enforcement or anything like that. Do, do they know of any cities that have been sued 
for the bylaws they've been enacted? Well, uh, I can speak to that in, um, uh, in some specific terms, I guess. Um, as somebody noted, um, these responsible contractor ordinances have been around for a long time. Uh, and uh, they're, they've been adopted by many cities and towns in, in the Commonwealth. Uh, the first one that was adopted, um, and, and I should state as, as Lauren noted, uh, in the first instance with respect to the responsible contract ordinance, the dispute initially goes to the Attorney General in the form of a bid protest. And when the um, City of Cambridge adopted the first REO that I'm aware of uh, back in the early 90s, I think, uh, there was a bid protest, went to the Attorney General's office, the REO at that time had provisions uh, requiring not just compliance with, you know, the prevailing rate law, but uh, it required all contractors to provide health insurance for all the workers that were working on the project. And this was long, long, long before the universal um, health care uh, was adopted in Massachusetts. Uh, and it required uh, all contractors to be participating in a uh, registered apprenticeship program. Uh, and the attorney general took up the bid protest and dismissed it out of hand as not being inconsistent with the public construction bid laws, the procurement laws that, that we've been addressing. And I'm not aware of any other uh, bid protest that's, been, that's followed since then uh, over REOs like this one. Uh, there has been some litigation involving um, the provisions that required um, participation in retirement plans and apprenticeship programs uh, in the federal courts uh, and the federal courts have have uh, in in this area in this region have held that they're unlawful uh, which is why when we've been um, pushing these uh, promoting these uh, kind of updated and and beefed up responsible employer ordinances uh, we have not been pushing those provisions because they're legal issues. And, you know, it's sort of worth noting that um, for the most part, the conditions are simply requiring that um, the contractors comply with existing law. And, um, uh, and, uh, and other than that, it's, 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 the, it's the diversity and, and local hire um, requirements that are, that are sort of added to those provisions. Um, and I think it's worth noting that um, the Attorney General's office addressed a letter to the chair of the council earlier this year in June, I believe, that's been circulated, um, you know, noting that wage theft um, and tax fraud and insurance fraud, which kind of go hand in hand with wage theft, is a really significant problem and a really top priority for the Attorney General's office. And the letter is you know basically noting that other cities and towns have adopted these things, uh, and and I think could be fairly read to be encouraging cities and towns to, in fact, it actually expressly um, urges cities and towns to step up and do what they can to address the problem because the attorney general's office doesn't have the resources to address these problems uh, sufficiently. I think it's also worth noting that in terms of. Uh, enforcement of the responsible contractor part of it, uh, the city would not be enforcing the ordinance. I think the idea, and this is sort of a fundamental um, concept, is that the idea is that these provisions get incorporated in the bid documents uh, so that all the contractors who are bidding on the project are aware of them and they typically get incorporated into the ultimate contract document itself. So to the extent there are violations, um, uh, there an enforcement. It's not a matter of enforcing an ordinance. Uh, it's in a matter of enforcing the contract, the terms of the contract. So it's a contract enforcement issue, not the question of the city enforcing its laws as a as a government, but it, as a as a buyer of construction services. And I think that I, I don't want to take any more time than necessary. But if you have any further questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Chris. Um, other questions from my colleagues? Uh, Kathy, please. Uh, 
Yeah, you need, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was just, uh, I'm unmuted now. Um, one of the issues that was raised by Lauren, but also by Andy was um, town expense in terms of staff time and in, attorney time. Um, could you, um, either Lisa or, and or Chris, talk about once towns, I know this has been in, a concern of it, attorneys in a couple other towns or cities that went ahead and did these. Has there been a burden. And the other thing I want to make a point that Chris just made is for the most part, the action that would be taken would be after the attorney general found there was a violation. So there would be evidence that there was a violation, but I just, the enforcement burden, staff time, attorney time, has it been a lot, a little? Can you talk about different cities and towns? Uh, I can't speak directly to the experience of other cities and towns in terms of um, in terms of staff time and enforcement time, but I think as as Lauren noted, um, it's it's really at the end of the day, you know, this whole question is is a question of you know what is the city ready and willing to do and able to do, I guess, also uh, importantly to address the problem of wage theft and tax and insurance fraud and construction projects. And so, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's important to lay down rules and establish norms um, for contracting in, in the city uh, uh, with city contractors. Uh, and at the end of the day, though, obviously there are limits to the resources of any city or town. And so it's, it's really, as Lauren noted, it's, it's, there's cities and towns have discretion in the extent to which they, um, they're able to or want to uh, enforce all the various bylaws uh, that exist in, in any city or town. And that would include um, this ordinance or the terms that get it baked into a construction contract. Uh, and so it's, it's really, uh, it, it, it's really at the end of the day up to the city to determine what, it, how, man, how much in terms of its own resources it wants to devote to that, to that project. I would add that um, it, Lauren at one point compared to what Boston is doing. And so some, what we've found is that some of the bigger communities, Boston, Worcester, Springfield have um, they have more resources certainly than a town like Amherst and um, and so have put some of those resources have prioritized this issue in recent years and and have hired a um, compliance officer who will go out and you know check payrolls and check job sites and more assertively um, approach the issue and um, do more follow up with contractors on it other cities and towns that don't have that, those resources and capacity have found that it's still useful to have this, um, these requirements there. So if wage theft is brought to their attention, they can ensure that um, there are some repercussions for that contractor or developer that uh, engaged in it in terms of future work with the city. Um, but it's, you know, it's not something that they're putting in staff enforcement time into having staff go out and do this, this sort of, um, you know, searching for wage theft. Um, but it's enabling there to be in place repercussions if wage theft is brought to their attention. Um, and then I would also add that Lauren talked about the state legislation that's pending around wage theft. And that actually tackles wage theft in different different degrees. So even were that to pass, um, the state, the, the town um, bylaws would still be very appropriate and needed. And from my perspective, because um, what the state legislation does is it just puts more resources and more um, tools at the Attorney General's hands on how she can uh, go after this issue and how her staff can go after the issue, but doesn't stop a city or town from still looking at its own um, municipally funded projects and, and how to address the, the problem. If I may, uh, through the chair. Um, Go ahead. Uh, I think Lisa's point is, is really 
a good one. Uh, I think it's useful to think of this ordinance as establishing ground rules that are important, that address an important issue, but more importantly, giving the town, the city, the tools to deal with it uh, through these contractual provisions and the contract remedies uh, to the extent it, it decides it wants to do that. It gives the city the tools to deal with this issue to the extent it wants to. Thank you. Um, unless there are further questions for Lisa or Chris, um, or if Lauren has any further final comments, I think this committee um, needs to decide what it wants to do at this point. Um, does it feel it has sufficient information um, based on our conversation today um, to declare this bylaw uh, clear, consistent, and actionable, which I think the emphasis is on actionability here, but um, or does it feel that there are still questions that we would like uh, Lauren and her uh, firm as our attorney to clarify for us? Because I think in the end, when we go to the council, what we need to tell them is not whether they should adopt or not adopt this. That's something we will each address individually as counselors. But as a committee, we need to feel that we have done our due diligence and that we can answer any questions counselors have. Um, in terms of the issues we've been raising today. So the question for you all is whether you're satisfied with what you've heard and you think you have enough information or would you rather that uh, Lauren go back and um, I think we should specify pretty clearly what we're looking for um, in terms of degree of exposure, degree to which um, this, uh, these proposed bylaws are not in agreement with state law. Um, that's, I guess, my question to my colleagues on this committee. Um, and I need to hear from you. And the rest of you are now going to see how sausage is made, and it's not a pretty sight. Lynn has her hand up. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Pat. Please, Lynn, go ahead. Um. I would feel so much more comfortable if this had a full legal review. And I say that after I've seen three counselors spend such enormous time along with the outside sponsors. But I really feel very uncomfortable having something of this magnitude come before the town without a full legal review. And I think that's what we wanted in the beginning. And we still don't have. So um, I want to make sure it is consistent with state law, at least for the fines. But in terms of whether or not we want to try to have additional conditions, I'm fine with that. Whether we enforce them is a whole other issue. But, you know, we do contracts every day for road construction, sidewalks, et cetera, et cetera. And at some point, hopefully, we're going to go into um, large contracts for new buildings. And this, it's making me uncomfortable uh, to not have a full legal review on such a significant bylaw. That's my feelings. Thank you, Lynn. Other thoughts from my colleagues? Pat and Kathy have their hand up. Thank you. Um, Pat, please. I'll let Kathy go first and then I'll go. All right, thank you. Kathy, please go um, ahead. Thank you, because I'm not technically in the committee. Um, if the committee decides to go that route, the suggestion I was going to suggest instead of going that route, just send this to the Attorney General and have them read it. Um, you know, do that 360. It seems that the key area, and I checked our own bylaws while, while I was online, we have a block when we did the revisions that said it'll be up to 300 in general, you know, as the maximum. And then for criminal, it says up to 300 unless otherwise provided by statute. You know, so we have a way of directly revising those two pieces um, that we zeroed in on. 
But if there's anything else in this um, that the Attorney General would find troubling, I would like to know that rather than just um, an outside legal opinion. Well, just quickly, it's not an outside legal opinion. It's our it's our, our attorney's opinion. No, I, I mean our attorney, but I just but but they are in the enforcers of the law, and they sent us the letter that we. Well, right, I understand. Out. I don't know how yeah. quickly the attorney general moves. Now, uh, we've already put Lauren on notice, such as it is, and I, uh, she's acknowledged it. That, um, but uh, does the attorney general move with with uh, great haste when we uh, send them something like this? Uh, I think there's an obvious understanding that. Uh, frustration on the part of many of us that this has taken as long as it's had has taken. I know I'm frustrated. Uh, I think I can. I think others are frustrated too. But um, so my concern with the Attorney General review is I have no idea. And maybe there's a simple answer. Maybe they they get on it within 48 hours. I doubt that. Um, but um, and Lauren has her hand raised, so I'm going to shut up. Lauren, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I'm happy to um, talk to them. You know, I, I doubt they would give an, a formal opinion because. <clears throat> um, the town is a city for purposes of um, state law with respect to bylaws, but <clears throat> I'm happy to talk it through with them. I'm also understanding the delay here um, or, or the feeling of delay. I'm happy to go through and just send you something back as soon as possible um, by the end of the week, if that works. Um, and again, I, I think the keeping in mind that this is something that the, you know, that, that, is of significant importance um, to the town. Let me just say, and I just wanted to clarify one thing about the responsible contractor bylaws. And um, from, a, from a local perspective, I know there are many, many re, um, responsible contractor bylaws. And I wasn't suggesting, I mean, the town has one, I wasn't suggesting that in and of itself that those types of bylaws would be significantly burdensome to enforce. Um, as the procurement officer seems to have said, you know that information goes into the um, into the project specs, uh, the proposal, um, and and is built into the contract. Really, I was more focused on <clears throat> the issue of um, local um, wage and theft uh, kind of structure and and um, enforcement of that issue. So I, I just wanted to clear up any misunderstanding on that. Thank you, um, Pat. Um, unlike Lynn, I am not feeling the need of a full attorney review. Um, I feel like it, what we've gotten from uh, KP Law uh, and from listening to Chris and Lisa is that it's clearly around uh, the issues of how much we, uh, fining we can do, whether it can be more than $300. And that's something that we can, uh, the sponsors can go back and look at. So I don't believe that we need a red line diversion. Um, I feel very much that it's, it feels clear to me that this is an issue of enforcing contracts, uh, not, and that is something we have the right to do. Um, and I don't see that there's anything else in the bylaw or um, in either set uh, that needs changing. Uh, and I, so I feel like we've spent over a year, and maybe that's normal, um, working on this. I met Lisa, I think, in June or July last year uh, to begin work on this. Uh, and I, I do want to say that, well, I'm going to stop. But I don't think that we need to send it back to KP Law. And um, no matter how quickly they say they will respond, because I think I know what they're going to say. Lynn, your hand is raised. Um, actually, I'm sorry. Your hand is unraised. I, I'm sorry. Take it down. Thank you. That's okay. Um, uh, Mandy? So as a sponsor, I don't want it to go back because I think we've heard enough. Um, but as a GOL member, um, I think I would want a limited review and a very limited review. Um, I think it's been clear from this conversation that the by going further than the state law and restricting or adding conditions that are not in conflict with the state law but are in addition to the state law is some risk we take but is not something that makes a bylaw inactionable. Um, and, and we've heard from 
Lisa and Christopher about the potential for the legal actions that would come with that, but that's not, and but we've heard from our own attorney that that is something that's totally defensible because it's not inactionable to create conditions that are either more strict or not addressed at state law. Um, and so I'm not concerned about anything that might be more strict or um, not addressed, something we add in. Um, I think what I would want a review on potentially is a declaration because we heard today, n not from the email we received, but from the conversation that the fines were not allowable at the level we put them at, at least on the criminal side. And so that's something that's in direct conflict with state law and directly inactionable in a sense that would, that would um, invalidate that portion of the bylaw. And so I think a limited review to tell us if there is anything else that is in direct conflict with state law, um, such that it would potentially be invalidated um, or unenforceable because it's in direct conflict, not because it goes, it, it extends state law or it goes further, but the actual direct conflict where we could be pointed to MGL says this, yours says this, they don't agree. Um, <laughs> might be helpful to be able to go to the council and say there is nothing that directly conflicts with state law and therefore this is actionable, even though there is some risk to, you know, there's never any no risk, you know. So I think that, and, and it pains me to say this as a sponsor because I know it delays even farther getting this to council. Um, but I think that's the, that's probably the type of review we were really seeking in the beginning. Um, and what we do need to hear from is whether there's anything in direct conflict with state law. I'm going to abuse my authority's chair and speak. I see Pat's hand raised, but Pat has already spoken once and I feel I need to say something here. Um, I'm also willing to let Andy speak if he wishes to speak before me. Um, we've heard now from three of our members of the committee um, and I feel I need to say something before we go back to Pat. So um, we have a, a, just an obligation to do this right. And we have to be able to explain to our colleagues, um, you know, what the, as Mandy suggested, what specific uh, issues uh, there exist in this bylaw. And we need to be able to explain that. And I need to write a report that explains it. And um, I think I really would need some kind of, of uh, advice, written account from KP Law. Um, I like Mandy's idea of, of trying to keep it fairly focused. I think Lauren obviously has been listening very carefully. She has a pretty clear understanding of what our concerns are, and I think she could address those um, fairly specifically. But I would feel, echoing Lynn, very uncomfortable with a new bylaw and just going to the council and saying, well, based on our conversation, da 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 da, here's what I think, you know, and, and fine, but I think we need, um, and I think it's true of all. Now, we also have another bylaw that, that, uh, We'll be dealing with next time, um, Wild Animal Act, and not to compare. Well, we'll not make it anyway. Um, we got a review on that, which basically said that was it. So, um, I need something from KP Law. Is my feeling, um, and I like Manny's idea of keeping it focused. I know Lauren's been listening very carefully. Um, degree of exposure, where we're in conflict, um, that we can then share with our colleagues and I can use to write a decent report. And then I think we've done our job. It's frustrating it's taken this long, but it, it has. Can I, I just I, jump in before no, Andy? Pat, just a minute, let me, me, me say get to my is, oration. Yeah, you know me. Go ahead, Pat, please. Um, uh, I was gonna say that I could, uh, I could go along with what Mandy was proposing, um, and I can. However, I want to set a time limit on the response, not only to limit what's looked at, but a time limit because we need it and we need it quickly. Actionability, um, all of this cl uh, clarity, et cetera, are important to me as well. But I also um, want a time limit, very short time limit. Andy has his hand raised, Andy. Yeah, I, it, just in response to Pat, I think that a time limit makes me feel uncomfortable because our goal is not 
just to do it, but to do it right. And um, I think that Mandy's um, suggestion about how to proceed, I'm um, entirely comfortable with. Um, and it's going to take, you know, we would like to have it as soon as possible, but um, it takes the amount of time it takes. But in the end, I want to make sure that we've done it right and we've done our job. So I support Mandy's uh, idea of a very focused additional review. Uh, I'm going to recognize Lauren and then Lynn has her hand raised. But Lauren? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, you know, obviously I have been listening very closely. I know what it is that you're concerned about and what you're looking for feedback on. And I also understand that it's it's uh, been out there for a long time. So I'm happy to uh, commit to you that I'll get it for you by the end of Friday, um, the review. And then, um, you know, if you want to have another uh, conversation, I'm happy to come back and um, explain. But hopefully that will give you what you need to, to write your report and will highlight the exact things that we think you should take a look at. Um, and, and again, even then, my perspective is, um, whether to go forward is a policy decision or how to go forward is a policy decision. So, um, you know, I, I will point out the conflict with state law with respect to the, um, the fees. Um, and if there's anything else like that, I'll also point that out. But other than that, um, you know, again, as I said, I think it, it is a, a policy decision um, and how you choose to allocate your resources is completely uh, within the, the town's discretion. So I will do so and I will do so with speed. Um, I see Lynn's hand up, and then I see Mandy's hand up. Lynn? Can I, can I assume that if you do the fast turnaround, which I absolutely would appreciate, and I don't mind the minimal review, there would still be time to, and an opportunity to consult with the Attorney General? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, um, I will give them a call. I, I work with them on bylaws on a regular basis, so I'll give them a call to talk through these issues with them and I will be able to do that before the end of the day on Friday. So hopefully I can at least, you know, again, as I said, they don't issue formal opinions on matters that are not pending before them, but I should at least get kind of the feedback about what their concerns um, or issues might be, or maybe that they don't have any and I will pass that along to you as well. So can I just summarize what I hope we're hearing? Okay. Fast, focused, consistent with state law, consultation with the Attorney General. And now I'm going to add, and if you see anything else that we need to pay attention to, you will bring it to our attention. Certainly. Not, not, um, and that will all be done by Friday. You bet. <laughs> That's all right. I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat kidding, but um, we meet again on September 16th. So that would, uh, this body formally meets on September 16th, but by Friday would be excellent because that gives me a chance to begin to think about how I'm gonna prepare my report. Also mm -hmm. gives us an opportunity if we need to reach out to you again with further questions, which would I assume be on September 16th. Okay. Same time, same station, same everything. Mandy. I just want to make sure that she that KP law has the most recent versions of the two. So because we've had we've gone through so many. So um, the two that are in the packet today are the most recent ones. The red lines are just there to show that the red lines would be accepted in these versions. They were there to show some changes based on I don't know whether it was GOL or CRC or something, um, but assume the red line an, a full except all is the version of that red line. Um, and, and I don't know, George, whether that would be something you would be able to send to Lauren just to confirm yeah. that we're oh. reviewing the yeah. most yeah. recent version. Yes. Yeah. Um, Lauren, stand up, Lauren. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I'd also love a copy of the Attorney General's letter because I think that would pre um, prepare me to speak with them um, and, and to try and be focused on what the issues that we have are. And um, if you could provide them to me in a word format, that's very useful because I can then accept the changes and um, and kind of start from a blank, you know, a, a clean a clean sheet. I'm going to count on one of my colleagues after this meeting is over to help me find that document. Maybe Lynn, somebody. Anyway, we will do that. The answer is yes. 
Um, the chair is at his fingertips, but that's just because you're dealing with me. Chris? Um, I can provide a copy of the Attorney General's letter. I have it. Chris, thank, thank you. So you could send that to Lauren directly? I'd be happy to do that. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, is that a hand up there, uh, Kathy? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Go ahead. So I, I was just going to say, Lauren, I think we've heard you loud and clear on the amount of the fines. So to not have you have to say a lot, you know, if we changed it to 300, are we okay, would be useful to hear from you. Okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right. I'm ready to uh, bring this to a close, uh, unless there's anyone else who has something they really, really need to say. Um, I'm very grateful to our guests, Chris and Lisa, and their contributions. Um, very grateful to Lauren and her contribution. And I feel like we've actually made some real progress today. And we look forward to hearing from uh, Lauren uh, on Friday. Uh, Chris is going to send her a copy of the uh, Attorney General letter. I will make sure she gets a copy of both um, the uh, bylaws that are in the packet. So with nothing further, we're going to turn to goals and we have 30 minutes. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you Chris. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Hey, colleagues. I just resent all of you the Attorney General's letter. Thank you. Somebody can forward it to Lauren. Thank you. So, we have, um, I think, a very, well, I think a fairly daunting or challenging task. Um, and we have 30 minutes. And uh, Lynn, I think, has even less. Lynn? Yeah, so I, I've thought long and hard about this issue of setting goals that encompass the intent and the infusion of other goals into each other. And I would like to suggest that we at least consider um, a paragraph in the opening area of the goals that talks about the fact that goals are, should be seen in a cross-hatched way. I have suggested language I'm not saying that language is perfect, but I really um, want to um, suggest that rather than mess in a, any great detail of trying to write in grace, equity, and, and environmental sustainability into every goal, that we look for an option that allows people to see the goals holistically and in concert with each other. And because somebody just did the screen, I can't get to my suggested language um, to pull it up. I don't know why. Hold on. Let me see. What you, you can share your screen now, Lynn. Okay. Um, thanks. Hold on. So this is the kind of paragraph I'm talking about. And just, it was kind of in the vein of what I said the other night. I see Andy's hand is raised, so I'm going to recognize Andy. Yeah, well, I really raised my hand on a different topic, so I think it'd be better to stay with this topic and then come back to me after we've done. Okay, fine. Thoughts on Lynn's suggestion? Thoughts on the question of trying to interweave um, one or two specific goals into all 11 goals? Mandy? 
I think this is a good, um, in some sense, compromise from what I heard on Monday night between a desire to try and put words into every goal from some other policy goals, um, whether those words be climate action, sustainability, resiliency, and add them to policy goals two, three, four, five, and six, and management goals one, two, three, four, and five, or um, for the same with racial equity, where you add the words racial equity and social justice and some of these other things into policy goals one, two, three, four, and five, um, and management goals one, two, three, four, five, six. I know there was a desire by a number of counselors to do that, and it seems like on Monday there was also a desire from a number of counselors to not do that um, because of the one complicatedness that becomes in trying to do that, um, but also the fact that a number of the counselors that might not have favored that method believe that they are equally important and should all be weaved into every goal. Um, so I think this is a good compromise. I, I'm not a big fan of the third sentence here, I will say when we get to specifics. I think the first two sentences are great. I, I guess the third sentence to me is a bit confusing and unclear. Um, I, you know, I don't know whether the wording could be thus each goal should be viewed as or should be woven or, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure I can come up with the wording, but um, um, should be seen as being included in the intent of the other 10 goals or something um, that sort of attempts to do that wording of each of the goals, you know, is included in all the others, so. I, I have no pride of authorship. I'm just trying to get a statement out there. I see Pat's hands, hand is raised. Yes, thank you for this, Lynn. I think it's a, a interesting compromise, but to me, it feels like only part of a compromise. Um, I think that I would like to see, I don't know whether it's a, you'd call it an appendix or an additional page that lists some of the um, racial equity goals, what they would look like. Um, I think there are ones that the council does agree on. Um, and also, therefore, um, some of the uh, energy and climate action goals also being re reflected in a short paragraph separately from the actual statement of policy and stuff. I, th I, don't, I think that might help in addressing some of the tension around these issues. I think there's, I'm gonna speak for myself here briefly. Um, I think, as I said at the council meeting, we have s six policy goals that I'm excited about and that I can speak with passion about and that I can share with my constituents and some who might have some reluctance. I think I can argue forcefully and strongly for each of them. This attempt to try and weave them together does not seem to me to come from the council. I think the counselors as a whole, um, again, I may be mistaken, but my reading is that um, these six policy, and particularly, I think all the goals, but particularly the six policy goals, after much discussion and thought and input from a number of different uh, voices, reflect, I think, a general consensus. Once we move away from this, we try to wordsmith it, try to interweave, whatever. We get into tricky ground. We get into people assuming that there's agreement when there isn't. That we get into thinking that um, there's sort of some consensus when we really haven't had a discussion about this idea of how we need to interweave things. Um, so I personally support these goals and um, look forward to figuring out how we're going to implement them. But I think we're getting ahead of ourselves, first of all, as a council, let alone as a community. Um, and I think we should um, basically stand fast with what we have and be proud of it. Um, any attempt, I think, 
to go beyond this at this point, uh, at least in my mind, is going to raise questions of whether there in fact is a consensus and whether in fact we've really discussed some of these things in detail, because in fact we haven't. But what the, the beauty of what we've done is we've connected each of these goals to a specific action by the council. And that to me suggests consensus and agreement. And I think they also touch on six really important goals that give Paul a clear sense of what we want him to focus on. But I think some want to also get to the end result. And that I think is a problem because there are many voices yet to be heard from. There are many uh, difficult issues that need to be thought out and discussed and reported back on, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think these six goals have that problem. I think we are united in our commitment to all six. So my personal feeling is that what we have is, is strong. As Mandy pointed out, we heard conflicting voices on at the council meeting. Some arguing that we need to, you know, do some wordsmithing. Others felt this is good as it stands for the moment, given where we're at as a council, given where we're at as a community. Lynn has her hand up. I, I want to also uh, mention what I think another council who is not here in this group right now said, and that is a goals document needs to be viewed as a living document. And that we have various conversations, uh, for example, about the proposal provided to us by the race equity group. We have future items to come before the council, the much more detailed plan regarding climate action and any number of other things, including uh, the town manager's proposal regarding some kind of race equity task force or group or police commission or whatever. And with each of those, we can always come back and revisit the goals. Um, but I'm um, feeling like we don't have, uh, we have not had the conversation as a council where we have focused on, for example, the um, uh, sustainability goal uh, plan that is to be brought forward sometime this fall. Uh, we have not had a time as a council to be able to focus on the race equity task force, all of their proposals. Um, and we would, and but we can always agree to come back and look at the goals. In fact, when we pass them, the motion could even say they should be, be reviewed every two months or something at a council meeting. I, something that allows us to see this as a living document. That's all. Thanks. Andy? Yeah, I, th I think that uh, Lynn's addition makes sense as a, and I appreciate the word cracking that we quickly did with Mandy's help. Um, I don't think that I want to go farther than that. I have some word suggestions on another goal which I'll come to later, but um, I don't really want to do any major changes at this point. It is we, we started with the idea that we wanted to establish policy goals that um, were things that we wanted the town manager to work on and work with the council on, but that we did not want to micromanage how um, they get done or what the outcome would, of a process would be because we entrust a professional to do that in a professional manner and um, to try and go beyond um, where the policy goals are um, other than the kinds of editing changes we're talking about, I think is uh, taking us farther than we ought to go. Again, I have 
anyone else? I don't see any hands raised and my screen shows no hands raised physically. Um, I wanna come back to these three sentences then and see if we can reach consensus because I am struggling with all three actually. I certainly think the last sentence agreeing with Mandy probably should come out. Um, and I'm not really sure that these two sentences really say much. Um, it seems that they're there simply to um, appease certain individuals, some counselors and perhaps some others. And I am no problem, well, I do have a problem with that because this is a council document. And um, it's an expression of our 13 uh, thoughts and resolve. And so I appreciate what Lynn has done. I understand why she's done it. And I'm perfectly willing to be outvoted. And I'm not saying we have to go to a vote, but um, I guess I'll just repeat that um, I don't think this is needed. I don't think it reflects the consensus of the council, at least it doesn't reflect mine. Um, and I think these, even the, the first two sentences, really don't really say that much. Um, what says something to me is our strong and firm commitment to um, the uh, issues that we have raised, including racial equity and social justice. That's what matters to me. And that that commitment is real and genuine and we're gonna work on it and continue to work on it for this year. And we're asking Paul to focus on it. We're going to get um, reports back and, and further voices in the conversation. So again, I would personally prefer that we leave this as it is, but that's just one voice out of five. And again, I appreciate what Lynn has done. I know why she did it, I appreciate it. But I think that this document is a strong and forceful statement of our communal commitment and we don't need to do anything more. And I don't think saying that, that each goal you know, doesn't stand alone and that each should be viewed as a matrix. I, I'm, the word matrix always makes me nervous. Um, I was never good at math anyway. That's, I think immediately of math, I get nervous. I'm um, requiring that each goal be seen as including every other goal. It just, I'm sorry, it just, you know, we have a specific goal about mental health, homelessness, right? Um, so that's my thought. Um, we have Kathy's hand up and we have Pat's. Kathy? Um, I somehow turned my picture off and I can't figure out how to start it again. So you just hear my voice. Um, I, I think one of the issues with the sentence is it talks about 11. We have policy goals and then we have town manager performance goals. It's the, the six policy goals that are overarching and they inform the town manager goals. So, so I think you could simplify this. The six policy goals are overarching and should be seen as informing the town manager performance goals. You know, because it's, there's one set that says, this is what we believe in and this what is what we want to hold your accountable for. So the old climate goal used to read last year's is everything should be seen through a lens of climate. You know, so we don't have to say that again. So I would just, the six policy goals uh, are overarching and should be seen as informing the five areas of town manager performance goals would be, you know, one way of just completely link, separating the two and saying, you know, there's an umbrella that surrounds all of this, and these are where we're going to hold you accountable. So this, that was my edit thing, because in during the meeting, people were saying, you know, when we're doing this, when we're doing that, we're also thinking about this, but it was the policy goals. So that was it. I'm just going to abuse my authority. I like that very much. Personally, I think that that actually says something. It, it, it says something to Paul, it says something to me, and um, I could support that. Pat, your hand is up, please. Pat, I'm not hearing you. You're muted, Pat. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, I think we've done quite a lot of listening, and that was why we came back. 
and we worked on creating the racial uh, equity and social justice um, goal and also expanded uh, community um, health and policing. I forget what it's called exactly right now. So I'm, I'm proud of that, but I also think that we're not really going far enough um, in the sense that we had, we, we acknowledged this um, overarchingness in our conversations as GOL. We had a real sense that it was, that we were weaving, we accepted that. We, I know it was verbalized and we talked about it. So stating that seems to be an important thing to do. But the other thing I wanted to add, and, and I don't have an answer, is I feel like in this moment in time, I would like to see us where we do agree, acknowledge by adding uh, additional statements at, um, as an appendix or whatever, if that makes people in town have more of a sense that we are going to be working on racial equity and social justice, and we're going to be working on uh, energy and climate action goals. Um, th and then I think that's important. And I I'm thinking last night about some meeting I was in, <laughs> finance committee meeting, I think, where, where Darcy made this statement uh, about um, you know, outreach. She made a statement about the community, oh, community choice aggregation. We were talking about that. And someone, and I can't remember who, I'd have to go back and look, said, well, we, oh, Bernie, we could say it, we could have it faster if we weren't working on perfection. Uh, and we could get community choice. And for me, there's a similarity, similarity here. We're not going to get this perfect in terms of the community trusting that we're going to implement climate goals or the community trusting that we're going to inter, uh, integrate, in a poor choice of words, um, social justice and racial equity. So I think making an additional statement would be important. Mandy Jo has her hand up. Thank you, Mandy, please. Sorry, I can't actually raise my hand. Um, the second paragraph, very last sentence, kind of already says what Kathy suggested. Um, maybe we can just modify that. These policy goals should decide, should guide decision making at all levels of town government and its provision of core municipal services and are meant to be used by the town manager to set priorities, direct work activities, and allocate staffing and financial resources. Maybe all we have to do into that and are to be, are meant to be used by the town manager as he fulfills his management goals to, you know, and as he fulfills his management goals or something, or you know, we I'm don't have to read. Yeah, they yeah. are meant to be used by the town manager. It's already there. Um, you know, the, what the I'm, what I'm, saying, I'm, are, gonna, Andy, I'm sorry. Are, yeah. Are meant to be used and yeah. as he fulfills or works towards uh, something about just putting in management goals into right. Right. that. Could we take that sentence and say these policy goals are interrelated and overarching? I mean, I, I have no problem with making a statement that suggests that these are these goals are deeply interconnected and overarching. What I object to or I have problems with is trying to wordsmith individual statements of policy along those lines, where you're picking out a particular policy and, and making that something that gets repeated over and over again. Um, I have absolutely problem with, you know, these policy goals are deeply um, interrelated and I mean, we work the language, but interrelated and overarching, and then the rest of it, I don't think you need to mention management goals. You're absolutely right, Mandy, that that then makes the point that they should be there to be used by um, the town manager in setting priorities, directing work activities, allocating staff financial resources. That's, that's, that's great, that's fine. But I think what I'm hearing from some of my colleagues and certainly from some members of the community is they want a sense that certain specific goals be highlighted with all the other goals 
And that's where I'm resisting. Not because I don't think those goals are important, not that I don't think they're not interrelated or right, but they're all interconnected and all overarching. And I, that, so if we could put that language there, something, if people are happy with that, then I have no problem with that. And I don't think you need to add management at the end. I think it's there. And so uh, that I would be happy with. But again, that's just one voice. I, I, I need my colleagues to speak up. And, and maybe I'm, I'm in the minority. I'm perfectly willing to, to accept that. Um, but I really feel that these, these sentences at the bottom here don't really say anything of real substance. Whereas if you say that we acknowledge that these are deeply interrelated and overarching, that at least says something. But it doesn't get into the very sticky ground, I think, of trying to then take a particular goal or set of goals and then draft them into each of the other goals. Um, as I've said already, I don't think there's consensus on that. I don't think there's been strong enough community conversation. Um, I don't think it reflects the view of the council as a whole, but I do think the council does believe that these are deeply interrelated and that they are overarching. Maybe there's better language, but that's, that I can endorse and accept. Personally, Lynn. I think that's an elegant solution and it allows us to eliminate the whole thing I have highlighted below. Other thoughts from my colleagues, because I really do need your input here. Because um, um, I'm very proud of this document. I'm proud of what we've done. I'm proud of what the hard work we've, we've put into this. I, I'm proud of the fact that we have listened. Um, but sometimes I feel as if some people think that listening means doing exactly what they say they want you to do. And I re I'm sorry, that's not the way I work. I listen. I think I've changed some of my views over the last couple of weeks. And I'm not, I'm certainly not apologizing for that. But I don't want us to get ahead of where we are. I don't want us to get ahead of where the community is. Um, I want to bring people along. And I can bring people along with these six goals. And I can bring people along with the argument that they are deeply interconnected and overarching. And I can tell them we're going to do our darndest over the next year uh, to try and, and, and realize all of them. And at the end of the year, people can look at us and say, well, you didn't. But the specifics, we still have a long way to go there. So I think this is an excellent policy document. Do you all agree? Or do you, I mean, I'm, really, I'm serious. I mean, Pat, Andy, Andy, Lynn, um, I'm proud of this. Maybe I'm the only one. I, I mean, I think it's time we move on to, we have some specific suggestions regarding the actual goals. And I think it, we might have agreement on this paragraph and this sort of preamble, and maybe we need to move on to the specific goals and start getting into specifics. And that means using um, Councillor Shane's document, I assume. I, I can I can yeah. share that. Can yeah. you just add this little piece to yours? Already added. Thank you. And then I'm going to stop sharing. And I uh, before you let anyone else share, um, Kathy and I did some um, exchange earlier this morning about her version, and um, so I wanted to know if I could share. Um, the screen for a moment to show where we were on one particular goal. Um, and it's based off of um, her, her original edits. And of course, uh, to answer a little bit to George that was coming, I mean, we just, a lot of this is time. I think I agree with you. Well, so I'm just trying to get it. Andy to, uh, you were trying to say something, Lynn, and Andy, you interrupted her, and I mm -hmm. believe Lynn's on a deadline. Okay. No, that's fine. Sorry. I, sorry, sorry. I I was going to just say that hand up, and I'm actually I'm going to leave. Right. That's if you do other wordsmithing on the goals, uh, as long as we put this little phrase in, I'm fine. Okay. Thanks. So what I put on the screen. Um, is um, I think I have the wrong section. I need to move up. Uh, make sure that I'm in 
get into the right section because it had to do with uh, you know the four major uh, projects and uh, it was just a matter of trying to get the wording um, as clear and concise as possible and to also recognize exactly what was said by the council in the October 21st, 2019 resolution. And um, if you can see the comment box on the side um, with my comment in it, I think it incorporates exactly what that wording was. And uh, so that I wanted to um, at least put this out there um, is something that had uh, come through this um, uh, work that Kathy and I had been sort of exchanging on earlier this morning and she's still on the call and obviously um, I hope that she will speak up on it too. Um, but I'll just let you read it and see if there are questions about it rather than continue to talk. I feel it, it in some sense this is over determining. I mean, yes, we're in a situation where we're going to face some economic challenges, but um, I would prefer we simply state what our broad goal is here. And obviously it's understood that we're gonna face revenue and budget challenges, but we don't know that yet. We don't know what the specifics are. Um, could be worse, could be better, who knows? So I was happy with the way this was written and feel like it's being overdetermined. And in a way that I'm not completely comfortable in terms of consensus. Mandy? Yeah, this was one that I'm confused agree. because. I'm sorry, Mandy. This was one I couldn't agree to the changes that were suggested by Councillor Shane. Um, other than maybe the movement of, I, I don't really care what order we put them in, but uh, the addition of the word potential um, uh, could potentially be put into every single one of these four, right? Um, that's, that's the point of getting a plan. Um, and uh, the only thing I would think maybe we could add um, to the original wording is that the the council vote that you know we said the council vote that the council is committed because we got sent right, rid of the word the count the that the sense of the council is that the council is committed so i think we could certainly add the you know on the october 21 2019 council vote that the sense of the council is that the council is committed or something so so add those words back in um but um, yeah, I, I, I can, I, I've clearly got her wording ready to go for a screen share so that we can start accepting, rejecting and all on each of these policy areas. But that would be mine. Um, that was the sense of the council. Um, and I think the language that was added to the end of this, including the language that was added after the public works headquarters is is not something that council has voted on um, or that maybe the council agrees to and gets too specific. Um, I have to agree with Mandy on that. Um, go, the, uh, Pat, I'm sorry, we have Pat's hand up, Andy. Um, but Andy, I think you, let me, if you don't mind, Pat, I'm gonna let Andy go first. Is that all right? Uh, I'll try and be just really quick and then uh, so we can get on to Pat. And that is that the, um, Wording, I don't know what shows up uh, now as far as whether you see where my cursor is, but the part that says all four buildings in some, uh, the council is committed to a plan 
to address all four buildings in some fashion. I believe that is the language from the October 21st, 2019 council resolution. And that's why I tried to get to the very specific language as adopted in that resolution. I did go back and look at our uh, motion. I think one of the things we're struggling with is that we have specific changes that have been made um, or suggested, I'm sorry, by a counselor, but we're now looking at a different document that has some of those changes and some of your comments. So um, this is rather difficult for me, at least, to, to sort through. Um, I'm kind of sympathetic to Mandy's thought that we should be looking at Councilor Shane's specific uh, items and in places where you feel that you've got some point you want to make or change that you and she have come up with that you are mutually agreed upon, we can talk about it. But right now, um, we've got at least three levels of commentary going. Um, so I'm struggling with just, um, it's already well past time. I, I think this is important, but um, you, the, all of you will decide how much time you wanna to put to this. I think it's important. I think it's, we should be working with Kathy's original document and Andy, where places are appropriate, you can step in and offer further wordsmithing. But right now I'm completely lost as to um, the original document, Kathy's um, suggested edits and your further comments. Um, so uh, Pat had her hand up. I think her hand is down now, but if Pat and Lynn has her hand up. So I'm gonna to turn to Lynn. I'm back. Um, when I say, when in my mind, when we say, the council to provide the council with a plan. That means you will take into consideration all of the issues, revenue, budgets, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't feel that we need that specificity that was proposed. It, it's, it's inherent in what a good plan is. Are people okay with my suggestion? And I think it's Mandy's suggest as well that we put up Kathy's document and that we go through it. And um, that's what I'd like to do and try to get through that as quickly as we can. And then uh, hopefully we can vote or at least agree by consensus that this is what we're going to send to the council uh, for hopefully the last time. Um, but I think we owe it to Councilor Shane to, um, to, come, to look at her specific comments and respond to them. And we certainly um, open to Andy's suggestions as well. But I think we need one document to look at. And I think Mandy is probably trying to make edits as we go. And I think also for her sake, um, that we actually know what we're editing. Um, so we have the original document with Councillor Shane's um, suggestions. And we've made one change already to the preface, which I think we've all agreed to. And I think her first change or suggestion is under economic vitality. George, should we ask whether there's anyone that would want to make any changes to one or two at this um, point? That's perhaps wise, yes, thank you. So we have one or two in front of us on the screen. We've gone through it now many times, but are there any changes people would like to make from this committee? I'm happy with the way they are, but anyone else? I see Lynn's hand up. No, I'm saying no. Lynn is saying no changes. I'm saying no changes, Mandy? Andy's happy. Andy? Actually, let, let me confirm. Uh, at this point, no. I think there was something that Kathy, uh, Councillor Shane, put into racial equity that I would potentially want to see moved up, but I think we need to discuss it where she had inserted we, Yeah, when we get to it, please. Thank you. Okay. So I'm saying one and two are accepted at the moment as written. I'm sorry? Okay. okay. Item three. Mandy Joe has her hand up. Mandy, please. 
Sorry, I can't raise it um, to give you a clue. I'm okay with the change to remove all possible. Um, I do not like the change to number three, the adding availability of parking, including steps. Um, our vote was in the council was the downtown parking working group first sets. Um, we've discussed this cultural and economic vitality slash versus new growth before. Um, I, I'm not going to comment on that now because I'm not sure where I stand. Lynn? I feel like the changes to the uh, in the beginning are the first one getting rid of all possible and the second piece about new growth and economic. I'm fine with that. It takes away a controversial statement. Uh, I really bowed. I mean to Joe and this other one since she was much more involved with parking. I, I guess I'm a little uncomfortable with the introduction of cultural. I got nothing against culture, but this is called economic vitality. And I think that's a very specific, right? So um, I, you know, I don't, I actually do also believe new growth belongs in here because it essentially new growth is essential to our economic vitality. Um, Andy can explain this much more eloquently than I can but there's a reason why that term is there. 93% um, of our revenues are uh, based on property taxes. And many of the dreams that people have of doing all kinds of wonderful things seem to be premised on a notion that uh, money just will magically appear. Um, basically, we either raise taxes or we promote new growth. So I think that term actually has a very specific meaning. It's a very important meaning, but I, you know, so that's why it's there. I also agree that parking should be taken out. That's not what we agreed to. We just to implement actions proposed by the downtown parking group. So other thoughts, raise your hand. I agree, I agree yeah, with George. So I'm saying keep new growth in. Yes. I'm saying, I'm saying take out cultural. Yep. But I mean, I can live with that. I mean, it's called economic vitality. Um, but I could leave it cultural and economic vitality. I'm not sure why it's there at all because it's, it's called economic vitality. So why is it there? Um, so it's promote diverse neighborhoods, affordable housing and um, new growth. I mean, I, I just would just have and new growth in downtown and village centers. It's a master plan, right? So I would take out cultural and economic, I would just say new growth. Mm -hmm. um, and strike the addition to address availability of parking, including steps. I would strike that. Anyone else want to weigh in here? All right. I'm fine. Item four. I, I think Andy's trying to weigh in, and I'm uh, still unclear what our decision on number two was. Uh, okay. Whether it was economic vitality to keep or new growth to keep or both to keep. No, my point was new growth, I think, is important for the reason that George stated. It is um, a matter of incorporating a very specific term that exists in uh, um, state law having to do with Proposition 2 and um, is very specific to the budgeting process. Uh, uh, it, it was there for, I think it's there for a very focused and legal reason that is understood by the manager. So if that suggestion were accepted, um, Mandy, to answer your question um, or try to, that sentence would, st would read, I think pretty much the way it read originally, um, and new growth in downtown and village centers. And I, 
believe that's what it said. It did. It did, right. I, in other words, I prefer to keep the language as it was. And strike all possible. Did you have any other questions up to that point, Mandy, in terms of editing? You're okay? Okay. Um, item four, four major capital projects. Now this is, I think, where Andy came in earlier. Um, do it sentence by line by line. First suggestion, people happy with that? They wanna change it, Andy? Um, not to the first sentence, no. Do people feel this adds something important? Why, why is this being added? Is it, it needs yeah, to Mandy? be set in an elementary school. So the, this first change here was just moving it from down here in exact same language. Okay, good. The question is, are we going to move it or not? Okay. From last to first in the list. If we feel right. we need to do that to say this is our top priority, fine. The only thing that you could consider, and um, we were after the word Jones Library, um, to take out the word potential and add yeah. and the, um, so that it would read uh, expansion, uh, renovation expansion of the Jones Library and the replacement of the central fire station replacement of the park. Because, and, and, uh, um, right. I think that uh, yeah. um, it's not potential. Um, I think that it goes beyond. Uh, you, we kind of recognize that they, at some point, need to be replaced. It's a when question, not an if question. Exactly. So we've taken care of that line. I want yes. to go back to the very top where we've entered the thing about the school and say it's the replacement of an elementary school. Thank you. Thank you. And then I'm I'm the person that has the objection to all this other. Yes, uh, you're not you're not the only one, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is not something the council has agreed to, and it may very well be true. Um, Here you're referring to the uh, the word that is suggested for this. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's. And it's, it's a given of a good plan. It's editorializing, you know. I mean, it may very well be true, but that's, you know, but that's not, we're not in the prediction business. Um, I guess I'll speak only in the sense that uh, at my urging, we changed the evaluation to take out that language from the evaluation because it was going forward and I wanted to at least to have it considered for part of the going forward document. I think that that was kind of where we came out of that conversation on, mon on, on Monday. I, I'm lost, Andy. Yeah, I am too. Um, Andy, help us here. Um, it goes back to the fact that when we were doing the edits to the evaluation memo yep. uh, that we <clears throat> took out a section because it was dealing with what was into the future and it was about a goal for what we wanted to see happen in the next year and um, not about it, it didn't it didn't belong in a report about what he accomplished in FY20. No, Andy, granted, I just, I, we need to know what specific language you're either taking out or putting in. No, and right I, now- I, I, that, That's why I, um, I was just saying, I think that it, there is an argument why it belongs, but I'll leave it at that. Okay, so you feel, okay, fair enough. You feel this could be, remain, okay. So I have a suggestion. Mandy. 
I, I suggest we go back to all of the original language from here on out and reject all these changes. There's something I would add to the vote from the council, but I can't really do it logically until I have the ability to reject all of this. Once mm -hmm. I reject it, I lose it, so I can't add it back in. But um, maybe up here, right after plan, to provide the council with a plan for funding, a plan in light of changing economic circumstances for the funding of the, where we just are acknowledging that there are yeah. changing economic circumstances without, um, you know, saying what that will do to the plan. I don't see the point of that, Mandy Jo, uh, because of course we're going to be doing that. It just seems uh, we didn't have a plan really how we were going to fund all of them anyway. Yeah, even when things were great, even when we're going gangbusters. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, this is where I'm coming from, is, is very much where Pat is, and I, I agree it didn't belong in the town manager's evaluation. I don't think it belongs here. Okay. Because right. we're responsible and we're doing a plan, we're considering all of that. And I don't feel like we need to say that. That okay. kind of comes out, yeah. Kathy has your hand up. Can we? Uh... Yes, we can. Kathy, please. I will try to just say why I wanted, I didn't mind Mandy's language and eliminating all. I think we made, and Paul then, because we made very positive kinds of statements about the four buildings in October and November. We went out with listening sessions and he had a very upbeat theme. Um, the title of the chart didn't say, can we afford with a big question mark? you know, for, you know, it talked more about how we can afford or how we might be able. So I wanted to do something that signaled that the council realizes we're in the fall of 2020, we're in a different world than we were in October of 2019, uh, of 2019. So Mandy's wording did it. Um, I don't know what, but it's not, you know, people are still in the Boy, you said everything could happen when you said we have all these reserves, you know, um, rather than because I'm encountering this with people that I think and I said, well, you know, we are not able to put as much into capital this current year. We probably won't be next year. And our stabilization fund is not being going to be added to, you know, so it's so some way of acknowledging in this that it's not the same world that October 21st, 2019 was to be permissive to Paul to not have to be just positive about it. He can say we have tough choices. We have, you know, we may have, we've got timeline issues, we, whatever, but he'll, he picks up on our tone. Um, so that, and I, I'll say this again, when we look at this, I just feel like we need to send a signal that we are more than aware of what's going on now. We're, we're gonna hear um, from Sean and company soon and Sonia on their best bet on FY22 um, with different scenarios. So that's all, all I want to say, you know, try to put something that signals the council is aware. Um, yes, I expect him to come up with a good plan a feasible plan, an affordable plan, all of those things. But um, I didn't want to put feasible, affordable. I just wanted to say in recognition. And George, I know we can't forecast it, but we're not coming out of this in the next six months. And that's going to do something to next year's revenue forecast just because of the business situation when CARES money disappears. Right, there's still issues about our borrowing capacity. There's still issues about the MSBA funding. Um, and so I guess I don't share completely your sense of, I mean, obviously we face difficult challenges, but I still think that we're asking for him, we're asking a plan from him. And I don't want to, I don't know what you mean by tone. Um, I'm just, <laughs> Pat has her hand up. I'm sorry, Pat, please. <laughs> we are <our> saying, <clears throat> 
tone can be misinterpreted. I think that if you listen to Paul's tone over the, since COVID, he's been very aware of the downturn in income and, and potential growth and everything. I don't hear him running around being all enthusiastic, we're gonna do the four projects. I also think that the uh, council is very aware of the limitations. So to me, this is adding, uh, again, unnecessary elements uh, to what needs to be a fairly straightforward document. I'm hearing consensus, um, and Kathy, thank you. I mean, really, these are very valuable contributions and they're forcing us to think very hard. Um, but I'm hearing a consensus, but I'm willing to be overruled that the way it's stated right now with Mandy's edits, pretty much back to the way it was with the moving of one part of one sentence to the top. People are happy with that. I thought Mandy had, I think, one addition she wanted to make. Can I, can, are people <coughs> agreed that the way this states at the moment, they can live with it? The no. addition I wanted to make is this, it is the sense of the council, because that was in the vote. Okay. And please get rid of the other thing about the school so I can just read it again. Oh, here. I've already moved it. So just you can get rid of it. Delete to delete it, right? Yeah. Point. Thank you. So to provide the council with a plan for the funding of the renovation slash expansion or replacement of an elementary school in accordance with Ford River MSBA grant application, the repair, renovation, expansion of the Jones Library, replacement of the Central Fire Station, replacement of the Department of Public Works Headquarters, consistent with the October, October 21, 2019 council vote. That is the sense of the council. Oh, sorry, here. That's all right, that's why we're reading it. That it is the sense of the council that um, it is committed or the council is committed is fine to a plan that will address all four buildings in some fashion. <laughs> we are, we're hedging our bets pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we can unhedge a little bit, but um, um, that's what it stands at the moment. Any further thoughts, any further wordsmithing? Um, I would, I would drop in some fashion, quite frankly. Um, you know. That was actually part of the voting language. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. no, the it's... vote was hedged very much too. Okay, right. so this this reflects the hedging. All right. Well, All right. It reflects the fact that we're going to have to be repairing these buildings until they fall apart, and we don't have any other choice. Right. And that I refuse to 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 yield to that view yet. But and that's my tone. <laughs> Housing and forty. So we're set with four. Okay. Housing affordability. I see no. Um, changes or suggestions. So unless people have something they want to add or change, we're set with, with five, housing affordability. Okay, uh, six, racial equity and social justice. Um, there's been an addition here. Uh, it states this would also include actions to implement a change in community safety staffing using the two frozen vague. I mean, I have a lot of problem with this. Uh, I mean, this is sort of like the end result that some might like or might not like. I, I have no idea where we're headed. I'm sorry? I do not see the reason to add it. Yes, I have problems with it. I don't either. Uh, we have not made this kind of decision. Um, the whole point of creating a committee was to really look at and make thoughtful um, decisions. Uh, and to take the time to make thoughtful decisions and this sort of saying, this is what we've decided, which is quite inaccurate. Um, yeah. And we can stand on different spots about this, but not. Sure. Right. But we have not made this decision as a council or. So I, I, my feeling is this, doc, this paragraph should stand as it was written. Yes. With no changes. Yes. Any other thoughts? All right, management goals. First, I'm gonna make a really inane suggestion just, just for the, break the tension. Um, since these are called management goals, I would like to take out management from all the subheaders and just say administration, leadership, and personnel. I would call it finance. And, and, you know, and just, you know, because they're all management goals. So, you know, we want him, the areas of finance, administration, leadership and personnel, um, and whatever, you know, just go through it. 
community engagement, long-term vision, right? Totally. That's fine. So yeah, that's, that's fine. That's just a finer. That's the problem. That. That's a, yeah. the easy one. Yeah. All right. So now we're done. We can go home. No. No. <laughs> There's some changes below. I know. I'm just uh, trying to right. So, no suggestions for item one. That stands. Uh, again, anyone have any further changes they'd like to make? It's a management goal, administration, leadership, and personnel. Two, we're not calling finance. Hopefully that's acceptable. I'll agree with finance now because you're giving me a headache by bouncing it all around. I'm, I'm not going to move it again. Sorry. <laughs> right. I'll move it when we get down to community engagement. <laughs> okay. All right. So under the suggestion under item five, studying, recommending, and implementing structures for user fees, water fees, sewer fees, and permit fees that reflect the cost of providing essential services. And Any thoughts, Mandy? So... I struggle with the addition of the word essential because some of the services that have fees, some people probably don't believe are essential and other people do. And so I, I think, uh, right. It seems a bit of editorializing here that in our judgment that, you know, I mean, we have the cost of providing services, services. essential or not, there's still a right. fee. We should address all the fees. Right. Right. I, I like the paragraph the way it was worded before. And again, if we start mentioning parking, then why yeah, no, no, right. <laughs> I agree. I, I, I wonder with that one, um, yep. you know, the mention, what, the, the such as availability of parking was a sort of, was the editorializing, but the address policy goals is not necessarily editorializing. That's fine. Um, you know, so th well, that's, what is that's it the at? one Mandy, that I would wonder whether we could leave the address policy goals in there um, because some of these fees, if we've set a climate action policy um, of reducing carbon greenhouse gas emissions, maybe we need to start adding fees to things that would help people lower their use of something, um, but without having to do that um, description of what policy goals we're looking at. Can I just add, um, I don't think I, I agree with taking out essential and um, the cost of providing essential services uh, and are in line. We're talking about water fees, uh, sewer fees, and I don't, th that are in line with other municipalities. So I don't think we need to have the address policy goals in there. Uh, and I'm, I'm even questioning that, uh, well, that are in line with other municipalities. Right now, our, our costs uh, for, for our fees are lower than many of the municipalities. So I'm not sure you need any of those. The whole issue here is that we're going to be addressing goals, policy goals. Um, I, I don't think that definitely needs not to be there. And um, and I don't even know if we need our in line with other municipalities because that's saying, oh, they're higher, so let's go higher. <laughs> exactly, let's raise let's them. Go up. It, it's, it's again, it's, I think it should end with cost of providing services, period. I guess the thought was that we wanted to encourage him to do some kind of comparative. Yeah, but he would do that anyway. That's like telling him. Right. You know, he does that. Every report we get from right. him at DCW has that kind of comparison. Right. So I think the other, you know, you mentioned water, sewer, there's also ambulance fees, but there's also fees for usage of the pool or LSSE fees and stuff like that. And those might better be set not just for looking at the cost of providing services, but ensuring that they are in line with other municipalities. I'm, I'm putting out there sort of a, a you know, a, a secondary argument here um, yeah. because I, our pool fees, we might want lower than the actual cost of providing services, potentially so that people use the pool, um, but potentially because if we put them at the cost of providing services, they would be so out of line with other municipalities that, that we wouldn't want them there. So I, I'm not as, against looking at 
whether they're in line, we don't want to set ours so high they're not in line on the other end, simply the because they will cover the cost of providing the service then. In the other hand, I think a lot of the services, um, you know, the fees for using the pool and everything uh, and other, we need to look at that because not everybody in our community can afford those fees. Right. So um, that's, I think, a decision that needs to come forward to the council. And whether or not that's in line with other municipalities, maybe there's something uh, that reflect the cost of providing services where possible, or I don't know. Um, uh, I have to leave again. Are there any major changes below the, what we're already seeing? I think there was one suggestion that you can see under item five. Yeah, I'm, um, a, I'm fine with that, but I, I've got to leave. I okay. leave it to you. Thank you. Okay. See you later. Right. Yep, bye. Can we come to consensus? I think Pat makes a good point here. So does Mandy, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> so- We're a uh, good team. No, well, I, I think we could just- Instead end with of reflect the cost of providing services, um maybe that consider yeah i'll go with that and then maybe in light and in light of um uh, i don't know either drop it completely or it, we certainly don't want are in line with i think Pat i would be okay with changing reflect to consider and then deleting everything else okay. after services okay yeah because as long yeah. as we're considering them doesn't mean we're going to raise fees or give things away or right Fair enough. Andy, any thoughts there? Are you okay with that? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> the grandson, I think. I thought That's so. it's a wonderful sound, Andy. It's it all right. It really is. Yeah, don't 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 mute. We could use <laughs> we could use a touch of humanity right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um so we're okay with two, uh, three long-term vision um, that is logical, transparent, balances competing capital needs and able to be implemented with available resources. Again, it seems like that's, you know, it could use unavailable resources, but good luck with that. That's right. <laughs> so I, don't I, I just, think we need yeah, it. I, don't, I think it's just, right. I mean, if you could use unavailable resources, that'd be wonderful. It'd be like a magician. I mean, just <laughs> Can make money appear. We should start, the town should start buying lottery tickets. Yep, yep. So I would strike that. It's just being obvious. In other words, just keep it the way it was. And then final suggestion here, relation with town council. Item five, providing regular communications to the council to, and then insert, respond to council requests for analysis or supporting documents and to ensure the council receives relevant information in advance of meetings or media coverage. Let's see if I can get the full comment on. Yeah, and the comment is this would include getting information in advance of, right, of course. Two examples. Okay, she gives examples here. Right. All right. Um, thoughts on this? I mean, there is, I think, I'm sorry, Manny, go ahead. Um, I don't like the order. <laughs> that's, that's actually, it seems a little petty, but, um, you know, number three is responding to communications from the counselors in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. Um, requests for analysis or supporting documents is a response to counselor communications. So I don't really like that that was inserted, uh, inserted before to mm -hmm. ensure the council receives relevant um, information in advance of meetings or media coverage. It seems like that insertion is um, 
a combination of number five and number three um, and sort of expanding on number three. So I wouldn't put that in front of the original wording. Um, in, it, we could add, if the concern is that we don't receive enough al analysis or supporting documents, we could add a, you know, sort of the parenthetical at the end of that, that is the including analysis um, and supporting documents as appropriate. Mm -hmm. Where would that get inserted at? You could put it under three. Yeah, that's what I was trying to figure out whether. You can just say including or in particular. Responding to communications from counselors in a timely manner, including or in particular requests for analysis or supporting documents. So it either fits in on after the relevant information. Yeah or up in number three. Okay, how would it read with relevant information? Providing regular communications to the council to ensure oh. the council receives relevant information, including analysis of supporting and, and supporting documents as appropriate. So you've, since you've done that here, um, but striking respond to, right? It would restrict, it would strike yeah, this you part. You just moved it, you moved it, right. Essentially, right. yeah. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at it, yeah. I guess two questions. One is where does it go? And the second is much more important, do people feel that it's, it's important to mention? It, it sounds like people are thinking it's worth mentioning. I feel like it's worth mentioning. We've struggled with it in the past, so I think it's something that we can add to this one. Exactly, right, right. And it's, it's helpful to Paul to know that this is something that, that we'd like him to, to, to pay more attention to. Yeah. Um, and so then the question becomes, put it in three. So we have responding to communications from counselors in a timely manner, which I think simply means, you know, answer our emails within 20 minutes when we send them to you. Well, how about in less than a week? Right. Because well, that's happened to me where I needed information and didn't get it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess I put it under number five and, and maybe Kathy can speak to why she wanted it in number five. But I think the reason I would put it there is the analysis and supporting documents are part of relevant information we need to make decisions, not necessarily getting back to us on a question. And Fair so enough. I think that's why it might be better in number five. Yeah, yeah. Now the cat has its tail raised. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought the cat had something to say. That is down. Right. See, I can't. Maybe, maybe that was a gesture. That's a cat gesture. <laughs> I can only see. Uh, oh no, there you are. Now I've got you more of you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Kathy raised her hand. Kathy, please. So, Mandy, am I unmuted? Yeah. Yes, yes you are. Okay. Um, yeah, Mandy flagged why I put this here. There are times where we were getting a presentation and only had partial information. So it meant we had to meet a second time. Um, and so that's, it wasn't a, you know, can you meet with me next week? Could you get back to me kind of a counselor th thing? So um, it sometimes it was committees, but uh, so I think the doing what you've done makes sense. Good. Now, unless there's a new item six here, I think we're at the end of the document. I think we are. And I think we've gone through it line by line, section by section. Thank you again to Kathy for taking the time to do this. Um, and it's forced us to confront a number of issues and make a number of changes. Um, I think we are ready to declare this Draft seven, version seven, is that correct? Um, um, maybe. Any further thoughts? Seven. Yes. That's number seven. I'm, let me see. I'm, I cannot right now be part of a consensus on this. Um, okay. I will not block a consensus. 
but I feel like I would like to have the uh, paragraphs about racial equity and energy added as an uh, appendix or whatever. Yeah. But I won't, won't block the consensus. Well, Pat, that should be noted certainly in the report. Um, is that sufficient? I think so. you, you can vote no. It's okay to vote no, and then you can no, explain. I, know. I, try, I, it, I don't usually abstain, and but right now I'm thinking I can't say I can't vote in consensus as part of the consensus. Okay. I have to stand back from that, uh, and it may be that I'm going to do a no vote, but I'm still cogitating. I am proud of this document, so it's yeah. I think that the, from the perspective, the selfish perspective, of the chair. Uh, I very much would like to present a 5-0 vote, but there are times when you just can't do that and it's nobody's fault. Mandy, um, get your hand up. Yeah. Yes, I see. Mandy, go ahead. So I don't think we've voted this document ever in GOL. I think it's either been consensus or, well, let's see what they say. Um, <laughs> what what I was going to suggest is I, I've heard what Pat is saying and I know we had some really specific goals from ECAC that they wanted in this document that we haven't, that we did not necessarily incorporate specifically. So I guess what I would want, and I'm not sure I can support it now because I, I'm really confused at how it would look, Pat, um, yeah. with what you're saying. I understand, you know, that you're looking to add something as an appendix, but I don't really know what it would look like. Yeah. Um, and so I guess my suggestion is send this document as is. But Pat, maybe when we bring, you know, at that meeting, if we can have concrete look of what that would look like, um, whether it's the full document or whether it's some modified version of what we receive so that we can actually see what you're suggesting instead of try to envision it in, I, I don't think we're all envisioning the same thing. I think that would really help um, yeah, I hear that. The conversation. Uh, the other thing is, if the, if it were put together, and, and I can work on that, um, it would need to say that these goals or these um, documents have not been voted on by the all aspects of these documents have not been voted on by the council or something like that. Right, and I think that's the problem because this is this is a document that's supposed to reflect the council's goals, and now it's saying right at the top, but these aren't the goals of some councillors. And that's why I'm imploring people to try to find a document that while it doesn't say everything they want it to say, um, says what's really important. And I understand that you may feel, Pat, and perhaps you still do, that, that this needs to be said and it's really important. I think we tried, perhaps unsuccessfully, in that first paragraph or preamble, to acknowledge the interconnectedness and overarching nature of these goals, but shied away from what I think would be uh, a, a very difficult and I think very painful and very unproductive attempt to um, re wordsmith every single one of these again. Um, and again, I'll just make my same I argument. I don't wanna do that. And like I said, I think this is a good document and it does reflect listening on the part of this committee um, when I said that I won't block consensus, that means basically that we can pass it, uh, that yeah. so, so we can say that it was passed by consensus um, because I'm not blocking it. I don't know, maybe I should just, I'm not blocking the decision and there is, okay, I'm gonna go with it. I, I, am in, I agree that this is the document that we should prevent present to the council without additions because yeah. right right and we're not taking a vote and i'm basically i'm taking mandy's perspective which is this is what we came up with and um do you want more you, and each each of you individually can speak to it and if you have reservations you can speak to them at the council i can um, agree to that yeah i would you know is sorry no, I was just going to say, but Lynn is not here. I was just going to say, so you have a four zero one absent vote, I think, if you counting it as yeah, vote. Yeah, we have not done a vote before. I don't see any reason right. to do one at this point, because who knows this? I mean, I truly dread this thought, but it's conceivable it could come back to us again. 
<laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. I, I think that would be true. I know. Look but, how often wage theft has come back. <laughs> right. So, um, I would. That's why I'm trying to to get us to the point where we can, at least, you know, as a group, without necessarily voting, but just say, well, anyway. I think so, that you have the group behind it, behind right. you. Well, it's it's up to each of you to make their own minds. Um, but we agreed that this, by consensus, this is what it's going to be, what we're going to send to the council. And um, I will try to, Pat, I can certainly capture in my report the concern of one counselor that, that wished that um, these racial and social equity goals, and apparently, I believe, also the environmental goals. You can't do one without the other. So you want both, you know, ideally, and your, your wish would be have those two interwoven into- No, no, the, not interwoven. Oh, not okay. interwoven. I think that we've honestly taken care of that in this, in the uh, change of the preamble or whatever you want to call it, the opening paragraph. Okay. I would, the, the way I see it being added is that those um, documents with a statement about not having been voted on by the council have been suggested by the racial equity task force and or something like that. I don't so see them the in I'm not. The and, okay. Yeah. All right. Any further thoughts from my colleagues? Thank you all. Thank Emily for sticking yes, with yeah, Emily. My apologies to Emily. I'm sorry, but there's no way we could get around Probably this. Probably a good thing she's muted. <laughs> so I, she know, all right. <laughs> I was going to say, I get paid by the hour, so I'm happy. Oh, all yeah. right. <laughs> Good. Okay, that's, that's good to hear. We can not talk paid, to another. Not paid enough, I'm sure, but you are paid. Thank you, um, Emily. We're not going to deal with minutes. I'm, I'm too tired. I'm too you know whatever. What? Why can't we just, I move that we accept the minutes as presented because we've, I think upon we've all read them. Upon review of the chair, in other words, you accept the minutes as Yes, I, I would accept that. Upon Does review of the chair. Do have an objection to that? Well, it's up to you I, all. I trust George. I do too. Okay, there's two of you that need to re rethink your- uh, And we don't have to ha have them on the agenda again. And we just gave Emily a few more minutes. Right, so Andy, any thoughts? No, I think it works out. I've, um, Pat, I appreciate your flexibility. The, the, the thing about social justice goals, just really quickly, and the other goals is that I think we trust and we should trust that Paul will consider those goals. And it's really gets down to this political question of whether we have to place them into this particular document in some fashion. Uh, but I, you know, the, the most I would have gone with in any event, and we didn't have, I don't think we have to go there would be uh, to consider goals presented by the community because I trust that that's what he will do. Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, items not anticipated. There are none. There is no public present. Um, I can't imagine why, but there isn't at the moment. So there is no public comment. Um, future agenda <laughs> items. Um, I do intend to bring the Wild Animal Act to us uh, next time. I have to tell you, just to take a second, the very, very first district meeting that Lynn and I had <laughs> we were expecting people to come in about all in kinds of intense issues. And we had this one person bring forward the Animal Act, which is an important thing to look at. I'm not saying, but it was like this shock. They're not talking yeah. about the buildings. They're not talking. You know. Exactly. Right. Right. Now, and wage theft, George? I'm sorry? Wage theft, too. Uh, yes. Yep. No, wage it has to be on no. the agenda. Thank you. <laughs> How could I forget? <laughs> Understand that the Animal Act the KP law report was literally, that was it. That it said nothing. So when we get it. Yeah, and so that's something that at some point we need to discuss what we want from KP law and if we want KP law. Right. So that's all I'm gonna, yeah. I'm, been I'm, on that I'm say, I could send it back and say to Paul, look. Redline it. They, they need to redline it. But um, 
If it's clear, consistent, and actionable, why don't we just pass it right now? Yeah. Well, that's no, really I, why I, I'm going to tell us that. I think we just need to be more clear, and this will come up when hopefully surveillance tech comes to GOL soon, um, with what Very we're soon. looking for exactly from KP law, what the review, what they need to tell us. Is it actionable? Does it conflict with state law? Does it not? If it does, where does it conflict? What needs change? You know, and maybe we need to just go in. I mean, it seems so obvious, a, right? It, I mean, right. Well, maybe we need a document that we send to Paul that says, here's that's, the answer we need. <laughs> that seems like a waste of our time and energy that we would have to do that. I'm right. sorry. We don't send it to them to spell check it, right? <laughs> do you like the font? I'm asking for stuff from them and this, this complaint about their responses is not just around wage theft and oh, it's I know. ongoing all so right. um all right so enough all venting right. emily you've had enough <laughs> no no she's she's so we we have the wage we have the wage theft coming back and we will have the animal uh act and i will reach out to the sponsor anything else people would like um they have in mind you can email me as well but that's Beer. at the moment Okay. Can we go home now? <laughs> Please. Uh, yes, we can. I'm prepared to call this meeting adjourned at 1.25. And my deepest thanks to all of you and to Emily. And uh, go well. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Andy, I like your haircut. Bye.